Thank you so much, Stephen, for the opportunity to talk about this. I think it's a super interesting and hotly debated issue, and I'm, I'm super glad that, that we're going to have the opportunity to talk about it with Kurt as well, who I think um, has been following this closely, if I'm not mistaken about that. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and w I think we even had a specific argument about uh, about some of this as well, um, and including the state enforcement component to it before the oral arguments came out. Um, and so we we very much have been involved in these discussions. I think people in DGG know for for a while now. I was actually clued into the argument from from Josiah, who linked the the Bod and Paulson paper, and uh, and I read it there. And so you can sort of chart how I viewed the argument going forward. Before we start, I just want to be a hundred thousand trillion percent clear with everyone that we're you know that, that we're discussing. I at no point, <laughs> and this might seem a little self-serving, said that it was likely for the Supreme Court to confirm the ruling from the Colorado S Supreme Court. At no point, and you can watch every single discussion I've had since then. And if you want, I can have Stephen put up a. Uh, a bunch of clips where it's it, I very clearly say that the most likely thing to occur is for overruling the decision by the Colorado Supreme Court. Uh, show of hands well, real quick. Who thinks that the Su United States Supreme Court is actually going to uphold this other than Jeb Tan? No one. Okay. I don't know. I, I, I don't not even these go. Yeah. Not even these no, go. I've put it at 25 to 30 percent chance that there would up, they would affirm the court. But I, I think there's a lot of ways for them to dodge the issue procedurally. Yeah. Uh, right. There are a lot of ways for them to say, hey, the First Amendment, you didn't meet the Brandenburg standard for incitement. This doesn't count as engagement. Um, you didn't give them enough procedural due process in the trial, even though I think all those arguments are absurd. But I just see this court as the center of this court is Brett Kavanaugh, guys. And just in it, even though I think the argument are strong and they are originalists to, to, to lack to its point th th these arguments are absolutely originalist arguments that would appeal to someone like amy coney barrett oh yeah, my god yeah. i just had a brain fart amy coney barrett um but like i just don't i think if you're saying if you're relying on this court and chief justice roberts who's very um greedy about the institutional legitimacy of the court i think he there are a lot of people who are Look for any opportunity not to say that he's disqualified, and so hey, see, that's why I put it on my That being said, and acknowledging that, I still think that the court got it wrong. And as we'll go through the opinion today, I think I have clear and um, strong reasons to think that. And if you want to disagree with my take on that, that's fine. You can, but I, I would just like recommend, or I would hope that you guys would give arguments on the merits of what's being said, as opposed to. They disagree. You're wrong. End of discussion. Mm. Right. And in terms of like the settled law, it is the end of the discussion in terms of some of these issues because the Supreme Court is the final say here. So it is the end of the discussion so far as those things are concerned. But have an argument on the merits about what you agree with and what you disagree with. And I think that that's a fair thing to expect from people who are commenting on the issue. No, I completely agree. I mean, there's unanimous Supreme Court decisions I disagree with, too, hopefully for a solid reason. So it's quite possible that the unanimous Supreme Court can get it wrong. So fair enough. Yeah. And, and there are some opinions even, let's say they're not unanimous, but they're like 7-2 uh, yeah. or 8-1s. You know, Ro Roe v. Wade was 7-2, which a lot of conservatives for years have disagreed with vehemently. Um, and I get a little deja vu to the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which I was against at the, in, in the time. And I, and I was very genuinely advocating that it would be wrong for the court to overturn Roe v. Wade, but they did it anyway. And I was always very upfront of the fact that Roe v. Wade is probably going to get overturned. I said it multiple times. It doesn't really stop people saying, sort of showing it in your face and haha, they overturned it. That's fine. That's, that's all okay, I guess, because y'all won and the Supreme Court agreed with you. But I would encourage people who are actually interested in having this discussion to have it on the merits of the opinion and the actual sort of rules of law that are being discussed. And that's all. And then we can get we can get started, Stephen, if you want to read it. Um okay, yeah. And for people saying unanimous <clears throat> decisions mean that Supreme Court isn't gonna change its mind. I believe Chevron versus NRDC was unanimous. I think it was eight zero specifically, and they're looking to overturn that as we speak. So unanimous doesn't necessarily mean the Supreme Court won't overturn itself either. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of times the Supreme Court doesn't realize what it's done to itself. Chevron is a good example of that, where I don't yeah. think that when they decided Chevron, they knew exactly what that they, they had done. 
with that case, which is like, you know, an admin law case, but now it's the most, it might, I think it's probably the most cited case in all of administrative law. It's gotta be up there. Um, well, administrative yeah. law for sure, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> But, and in terms of all law, it's 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 a very very yeah. well cited, um, and so it's just not the case that you can say ha ha nine zero or whatever. Especially in this case, where as you'll see, there is a deeply fractured court on a humongously important issue of mm -hmm. law in this case, and that's a and from what I can tell, it's a five four decision. Um, so so yeah, it, like don't stop your analysis at they, it got overruled. We knew that they were gonna. Well, I thought it was very likely that they were gonna get reversed. That's not the interesting they question. They do seem to be unanimous insofar as they don't believe the states can do this. But there right. is a division that as is, to whether or not some federal authority that can That is do unanimous. This. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay, can I start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'm questioning, asking questions about a lot of legal shit so that we uh, are all on the same page with this, and then I'll learn this as we go. Um, but, okay, so number 23, 719, means that this case was filed in 2023, 719 thing that the court has touched uh, in that year. Uh, this is Donald J. Trump, who is the petitioner, versus Norma Anderson uh, et al. Are these the people um, in Colorado that do the ballot decision making, or who precisely are these Anderson people? was a voter. Okay, so these are... Just, he's just a voter. Okay. They're electors under Colorado state law. Okay. Electors under Colorado state law. So not just so voters, not, but like the actual the, electors. state electors. So not like electors for presidential electors. Uh, that's how they define voters. Okay. All right. On writ of certiori to the Supreme Court of Colorado. What is writ of cer cer yeah. certiorari? Is, certiorari is a way to, yeah, it's like a Supreme Court review, um, and it's it's discretionary by and large. What do you I mean? I believe by it's uh, order for the records below. I think certiorari means records. Okay, and then when you say um, when you say review, that just means that they're taking on the case and they're going over it essentially, right? Yeah. Okay. They're reviewing a another an issue made. of federal law in this case. Okay. Per curiam. Does that mean unanimously? By the court. By the court. No. No, okay. no, it doesn't necessarily mean unanimously. It just means there's no listed author. Okay. If there's no listed author, you assume that it's the uh, chief justice that's authoring it or? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. This, Although I think this, this is like Roberts because really it, reads, it, reads, it reads a it lot reads like, like Roberts. Roberts. I think it's Roberts. Yeah. There's one part that I think is very Alito-y, but it reads like Roberts for sure. Okay. A group of Colorado voters contends that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution prohibits former President Donald J. Trump, who seeks the presidential nomination of the Republican Party in this year's election, from becoming president again. The Colorado Supreme Court agreed with that contention. It ordered the Colorado Secretary of State to exclude the former president from the Republican primary ballot in the state and to disregard any write-in votes that Colorado voters might cast for him. Former President Trump challenges that decision on several grounds. Because the Constitution makes Congress, rather than the states, responsible for enforcing Section 3 against federal office holders and candidates, we reverse. Last September, Section 1, Section 1, Chapter 1? Oh. Last September, about six months before the March 5th, 2024 Colorado primary election, four Republican and two unaffiliated Colorado voters filed a petition against former President Trump and Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold in Colorado State Court. These voters, whom we refer to as the respondents, contend that after former President Trump's defeat in the 2020 presidential election, he disrupted the peaceful transfer of power by intentionally organizing and inciting the crowd that breached the Capitol as Congress met to certify the election results on January 6, 2021. One consequence of these actions, the respondents maintain, is that former President Trump is constitutionally ineligible to serve as president again. The theory turns on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Section 3 provides, No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution of the United States shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each House, remove such disability. According to the respondents, Section 3 applies to the former president because after taking the presidential oath in 2017, he intentionally incited the breaching of the Capitol on January 6th in order to retain power. They claim that he is therefore not a qualified candidate, um, and that as a result, the Colorado Secretary of State may not place him on the primary ballot. Uh, see, Colorado, uh, whatever statute, and then I'm, yeah, okay. Um, um, Any questions? 
I don't know how the um, respondents stated their case, um, but I will say that um, this part here of claiming that Trump intentionally incited the breaching of the Capitol would be uh, over what Section 3 would mandate for a person to be disqualified. Now, I don't know if the respondents put that on their complaint or whatever, or maybe, yeah. So I don't know how relevant that is. You're saying that because you don't think that it's required that there be like a mens rea component to any act which constitutes engagement for purposes of Section 3? I'm saying that the intentionally inciting the breaching of the Capitol, it, that language or that being a requirement is not found in Section 3. Because, for instance, giving aid or comfort to the enemies thereof could also qualify you for Section 3. You don't have oh, to I be the one mean. to intentionally incite. The answer to that is just that that's, this is what the respondent. Yeah, that's why I said it. That might have been what they put in their complaint. But yeah, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. what they are. After a five-day trial, the state district court found that former President Trump had engaged in insurrection within the meaning of Section 3, but nonetheless denied the respondent's petition. The court held that Section 3 did not apply because the presidency, which Section 3 does not mention by name, is not an office under the United States, and the president is not an officer of the United States within the meaning of that provision. See uh, app to petition for whatever 184-284-A. So I guess that's pretty good. Is this petition for certiorari? So gotcha. I'm, I'm, is this the know. first time? Um, oh wait, this is talking that's about the Colorado the, trial court opinion, which gotcha. held that he's not an officer of or officer under the United States, or um, swearing an oath to support the Constitution. Gotcha. That's kind of goofy, but okay. But still felt felt that it was a uh, insurrection, sure. an engagement, okay. and had that big like hundred page opinion. Mm -hmm. Um. In December, the Colorado Supreme Court reversed in part and affirmed in part by a four to three vote. Um, wait, hold on, wait. Fuck, give me like one second, hold on. Yeah. Um, and the Colorado Supreme Court is all Democrat, so it wasn't a partisan split. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, all right. In December, the Colorado Supreme Court reversed in part and affirmed in part by a four to three vote. Reversing the district court's operative holding, meaning what, the, the part of the holding that would have determined what action the comes after? Yes, exactly. Okay. The operative holding being the holding that controlled what happened, who won. Yeah, okay. Wait, hold on. Just as a quick thing, um, if I see anybody in chat saying anything like, I can't believe you're about to argue against the Supreme Court. One, this is just a review of the decision, you should read it. Two, if you are a conservative, you should self-immolate because you have no respect and no value for literally any part of the process of law except when it agrees with you. If I see you, I'm permabanning you, you're never coming back, buy matches and set yourself on fire. Please make the world a better place. Okay, just a quick thing on that. All right. The court otherwise affirmed, <clears throat> I do. Um, presidency is an officer under the United States and the president is an officer of the United States. Oh wait, okay. Uh, reversing the district court's operative holding, the majority concluded that for purposes of Section 3, the presidency uh, is an office under the United States and the president is an officer of the United States. The court otherwise affirmed, holding one, that the Colorado Election Code permitted the respondents' challenge based on Section 3. Two, that Congress need not pass implementing legislation for disqualification under Section 3 to attach. Three, that the political question doctrine does not preclude judicial review of former President Trump's eligibility. And four, that the district court did not abuse its discretion in admitting into evidence portions of a congressional report on the events of January 6th. Five, that the district court did not err uh, in concluding uh, that the events constituted an insurrection and that former President Trump engaged in that insurrection. And six, that former President Trump's speech to the crowd that breached the Capitol on January 6th was not protected by the First Amendment. C, what does id stand for? Uh, the same site as was previously cited. So, C oh, the thing that, was, oh yeah, gotcha, the previous yeah, site. So, yeah, so gotcha. whatever the previous site is, is what, what happened. Um, and so just to run through those real quickly, um, one is the Colorado election code. That's a, that's a matter of state law. Mm -hmm. um, two is the question whether or not you need to have self-execution from the perspective of Congress. Three is the political question doctrine. That is a doctrine that says that some decisions are either entrusted or specifically delegated to a specific coordinate branch of government, and it's not fit for judicial review. It's a, it's you know it's given to the political branches, mm -hmm. or that there are so little standards that um, courts are not like apt to rule on them. So an example of this recently, um, high profile one is Rucho versus Common Cause. That was a decision that said the Supreme Court or the courts in general, federal courts, are not fit places to have claims regarding political gerrymandering. 
and that would be an example of application of the political question doctrine. It's just a way of saying courts, for whatever reason, are not fit to hear those things. Uh, the fourth one has to do with hearsay, issues related to hearsay of evidence and, and the congressional report. That's more of a state law issue, by and large. Maybe you could thread it through a procedural due process argument, but that's um, kind of, are you allowed to bring in the, the congressional report into evidence? Um, five is whether what the definition of insurrection is and whether uh, Trump engaged in it, and that um, whether or not, and six is whether or not it's protected by the First Amendment. So those are like the six issues the court puts out. Okay. Some of them are state law, some of them are procedural, and some are substantive. Gotcha. The Colorado Supreme Court accordingly ordered Secretary Griswold not to list President Trump's name on the 2024 presidential primary ballot or count any write-in votes cast for him. Chief Justice Boatwright and Justices Samor and Barken Cotter each filed dissenting opinions. Uh, under the terms of the opinion of the Colorado Supreme Court, um, wait, real quick, for the structure of state Supreme Courts, is it always the same number of people or? No. It, it can be very different. It's very different. Okay, gotcha. Texas actually has, I think, two highest. They do court. have two Supreme Courts, just like Oklahoma does, which is weird. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. They have one for the civil side and one for the criminal side for some reason. Okay. Based, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, under the terms of the opinion of the Colorado Supreme Court, its ruling was automatically stayed pending this court's review. And then see the prior reference thing. We granted former President Trump's petition for certiori. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Got okay. It. Which raised a single question. Did the Colorado Supreme Court err in ordering President Trump excluded from the 2024 presidential primary ballot? That um, kind of encompasses everything all that was. But the state law issues, mm -hmm. uh, presumably. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and then see 601 US blank. What is that a reference to? That's a, another site citation, but because there hasn't been like um, a finalized volume yet, they'll put in that little blank. Okay. Right. Yep. Gotcha. Concluding that it did, we now reverse. Section two. Proposed by Congress in 1866 and ratified by the states in 1868, the 14th Amendment expanded federal power at the expense of state autonomy. And thus, um, and thus fundamentally altered the balance of state and federal power struck by the Constitution. So already you know which way they're going. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, you already knew, right? But what they're saying here is that fundamentally, like taking one big ass step backwards from everything, mm -hmm. we know that the 14th Amendment was meant to expand federal authority at the expense of state authority. That's the whole purpose of the Reconstruction Amendments. That's mm -hmm. kind of their kind of global purposivist outlook at the start. Do you disagree with that? Um, no, um, I think I think that's right. And it's the, also you can see it in the, the linguistic shift because in early America, you would tend to see the United States are, and much more today, the United States is because of this concept of the federal government gaining much more autonomy and, and sovereignty versus the state level. And I, and I have to say, no one can really agree with that global point. That scene setter, if you disagree with that, you kind of look like an asshole. Um, because everyone acknowledges, both as a matter of like, just practical reality, this is what the Civil War brought. But it also was the intention of the framers largely to apply federal rights to states, to impose certain restrictions on state authority throughout the course of the Reconstruction process. And so I don't think it's a good look to disagree with that kind of scene setting. And I don't think you have to if you agree, like I do, that the court got it wrong. So I don't really have a problem with them as just as a table setting thing, acknowledging that that is, in fact, the kind of global reality. What is it quoting when it says fundamentally altered the balance of state and federal power struck by the Constitution? Is that coming from the this, case? This The first case there in the, in the string site, Seminole Tribe of Florida versus Florida. Okay. Does that case reference the 14th Amendment? Uh, I assume it does. Uh, right now, I'm not, <laughs> that case is not coming to mind. I know it's a famous one, but um, but but yeah, I, I assume it does. Interesting. Um, okay. Um, 
<clears throat> Section 1 of the amendment, for instance, bars the states from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, or denying to any person the equal protection of the laws. And Section 5 confers on Congress power to enforce those prohibitions, along with the other provisions of the amendment, by appropriate legislation. Section 3 of the amendment likewise restricts state autonomy, but through different means. It was designed to help ensure that in, an in, yeah. It was designed to help ensure an enduring union by preventing former Confederates from returning to power in the aftermath of the Civil War. See uh, for, yeah. yeah. So you already see they're distinguishing Section 1 from Section 3. That Section 1 is different fundamentally than Section 3. They both restrict state autonomy, but they do so differently. Agreed? It's also interesting as a matter of practical reality that they took all this time to write Section 3 to disqualify all the Confederates and then basically immediately turned around and changed their mind. You know, Johnson pardoned everyone and, you know, a lot of the Confederates, a lot of the Confederates wound up being federal judges and all kinds of federal officials. So it was was sort of weird. You spend all this effort to disqualify them and then change your mind instantly. Well, I would counter that in two ways. Um, So one, when we say change our mind, we've got to be very careful what we say change our mind on. It seems pretty clear that they didn't change their mind on the amendment. Um, in fact, I think that they reinforced the provisions of the amendment by saying that for these particular people, we are going to grant them some relief by mm-hmm. voting in Congress to grant relief from what Section 3 would have uh, applied to them. Number one, because they did that. They went through the process in, in the amendment that was laid out for how Congress can relieve an injury from this, right? By doing a three-fifths vote to, to say that we... Yeah, I, don't, I, I didn't hear Kurt to say that they repudiated the Section 3, but I heard him say that the, um, the desires to punish the former oath breakers very quickly changed um, so far as the Johnson administration was concerned. Sure. And I just want to be careful because the I, implication I, yeah. is that like they did Section 3 or they did this amendment and then they thought it was a bad idea so they completely got rid of it. That was that felt like the implication. Maybe that wasn't the implication but yeah, I just want to be clear on that. I didn't um, hear Kurt to say that but... No, but he didn't say it. That's why I said it was an implication oh, not explicitly said. He fucking piece of shit. Um, the first part and then the... Um, uh, the second part is it depends on how in the weeds fuck. I brought out that paper. I might do this later where I go through the paper and this together but... Um, if you want to get really particular, it was designed to help ensure an enduring union by preventing former Confederates from returning to power in the aftermath of the Civil War. The first draft of Section 3 did have, um, it explicitly referenced the Civil War. In later versions of Section 3, and the one that ended up being amended to the Constitution, they did not explicitly call out former Confederates. That language was left broad, I would guess, intentionally, because it did explicitly refer to the Civil War, and then they got rid of that reference later. But... Agreed on that. I think that this language from the court does suggest, I think, that they view the Confederates in this situation as the paradigmatic example. But I don't, I don't read the court here also to be excluding that it could apply to the future. In fact, I think the rest of their opinion doesn't make sense if you take the, the some MAGA people's criticism that this was only meant to apply to the Civil yeah. War people, no mm-hmm. more. It really wouldn't make sense, the rest of their opinion, to read that that way. It's and possible. So, no, I haven't read the rest of the opinion yet, so I don't know. But I'm saying so far, that's what the language suggests. But maybe in the rest of the opinion, they don't say that. But um, oh, look, the next sentence too. Yeah, let's see. And they're citing yeah. statement of Stevens. Representative Stevens mm-hmm. warning yeah. that without appropriate constitutional reforms, yelling secessionists and hissing copperheads would take seats in the House. Uh, and then a statement of Senator Howard lamenting prospect of a state legislature made up entirely of disloyal elements absent a disqualification provision. Section 3 aimed to prevent such a resurgence by barring, from, for, blah, by barring from office those who, having once taken an oath to support the Constitution of the United States, afterward went into rebellion against the government of the United States. Um, and then this is a statement of Senator Trumbull. Um, yeah, okay. Going down further. Section 3 works by imposing on certain individuals a preventative and severe penalty, disqualification from holding a wide array of offices, rather than by granting rights to all. It is thereby, uh, or it is therefore necessary, uh, as Chief Justice Chase concluded and the Colorado Supreme Court itself recognized, to ascertain what particular individuals are embraced by the provision. I, I, I do want to say, period, this to me is a nothing statement to say it's necessary to understand which are ascertained. I mean, that's true of every provision. It's necessary to ascertain what this means. And so I don't really see, other than just giving some kudos to Griffin's case, or to cite Griffin's case, I don't understand why, what additional thing that that sentence is providing. Well, I think necessary to- something that we went over when we were having our discussion is, in some ways, Section 3 is incredibly narrow, 
And in some way, section three is incredibly broad and mm -hmm. understanding like where the narrowness and the broadness is very important. And I think that's kind of what this is kind of getting at, right? So for instance, I think we can agree that the penalty of never being allowed to hold another office essentially with an oath, that's a pretty broad penalty, right? Like yeah. that's a big deal. But the narrowness meaning you must have been a prior oath taker and that you must have engaged in or done something related to this like insurrection thing, I think that that kind of narrows it out a bit. So they're mentioning that uh, it's a preventative and severe penalty. So it's probably worth seeing like who this would apply to because if it applied to like a huge subset of the United States, this might be like highly problematic. I think it's an okay analysis to undertake, no? I agree, but I just don't think that you need a citation to Griffin's case or to the Colorado opinion to recognize that, yeah, it's a provision we need to understand who it applies to. Oh, so I, sure. I, I, okay, I think sure. that it's part of their um, bolstering of Griffin's case, and and they're trying to create a link between the Colorado Supreme Court and Griffin's case that you need to now. Again, we can. I don't read mm -hmm. too much into that. I just I'm just saying that. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's just an obvious point. Chase went on to explain that to accomplish this ascertainment and ensure effective results, proceedings, evidence, decisions, and enforcements of decisions more or less formal are indispensable. Um, for its part, the Colorado- It's also worth oh. noting, by the way, just before we move on, that uh, Chief Justice Chase is the Chief Justice of the United States, but when he's writing this case in Griffin's, he's serving as a circuit judge. So he's serving one level down mm -hmm. on the Court of Appeals level. So although it's from the Chief Justice, it's not on behalf of the Supreme Court. So Correct. just a little notation there. Yeah, because some um, hack journalists like Glenn Greenwald sometimes refer to the Griffin's case as a Supreme Court case, and it wasn't because, as you said, it's Chase not. was yeah, riding circuit on this one. Um, Chase went on to explain that to accomplish this uh, ascertainment and assure, okay, we read this. For its part, the Colorado Supreme Court also concluded that there must be some kind of determination that Section 3 applies to a particular person before the disqualification holds uh, meaning. I, I mean, uh, and again, I'm taking issue with this because I think this is just, it's too obvious and it's true of every single constitutional provision, right? For, think about the First Amendment. Before the the First Amendment has any weight, there needs to be some kind of determination as to what the First Amendment means. Even in an as-applied challenge, let's say that you're going to sue someone for, I don't know, for, for libel or something, and there's some First Amendment standard that's implicated there. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a determination. And to the extent that you think that, well, people are going to be um, privately dissuaded or not dissuaded from taking office or from, you know, uh, doing libel in the case of the First Amendment example I just brought up, um, then that's tr as true for Section 3 as it is for any other provision in the Constitution. The age disqualification clauses, right? If no one enforces them, to what meaning do they have, right? Like, if sure, no I one understand. Is I, yeah. I agree 100% with what you're saying, but I think if we're to assume that this is written for dissemination to the public, and we're to assume that like ordinary people are reading it, like this was kind of this was kind of one of the big layman's arguments about this. The first argument I had with you, this was it my was big, a, yes. yeah, it was like, yeah. oh, well, how do you determine if someone is engaged in insurrection like before you can even disqualify them, right? So I can understand them going over it, even if it seems kind of evident that you would have to do this. It but, makes sense. The only thing I'm, I'm, I'm saying here is what they're yeah. implying is that what the Colorado Supreme Court also concluded is that there needs to be a determination that Section 3 applies, obviously. And I mean, no, no one could possibly disagree with that. But that's true. It doesn't tell you any more or less about what I understand with what I understand with yeah. what you're saying from a legal point of view, but from the layman yeah. point of view, that was a big question. Can anybody just kick somebody off the ballot? Do you have to be convicted of insurrection? Who is allowed to make that determination? The Colorado I, Supreme I Court concluding, you. yeah, I agree with you from a I, legal, strictly legal point of view, right? but like from a layman's point of view, like I think it's a pretty confusing issue, right? I, I hear you, but 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 what's being implied here, I think, is like more determination than than something else, right? Like that Colorado is suggesting, or that Chase is suggesting that some determination separate and apart from other constitutional provisions is needed for section three application as opposed to other provisions, whether they're qualifications or not. And my entire point is all of these are just words on paper mm -hmm. unless people enforce them and determine to what they apply and to what they don't apply. But I sure. hear you on the point that, um, you know, yeah, okay. people. I'm not sure, strictly speaking, you need a determination as to the particular person with respect to other provisions in the Constitution because you've already know who that is some some other way. Well, but or the determination's be been made it, it, it made three, it's right? made in some other sense. But, the, but that could be true of Section Three, is my point, where you could just know, like the people could just know what uh, an insurrection is, right? And you could say, well, how would they know what an insurrection is or who engaged in them? Well, in the case of the Civil War, everyone kind of points and says, well, that's obvious. Everyone knew who the insurrectionists were. And my entire, you know, and, and to the extent that we would have case law on January 6th, if the Supreme Court were to decide one case, people would also know to whom it applies. And obviously there'd be cases in, you know, in the cracks and stuff, but 
to the extent that we're saying formalistically there's some distinction between this provision and other provisions of the Constitution, which at least as an initial matter need some kind of enforcement provision, I don't really see one. Well, like, I think, think, the, I think the, the difference. I think the difference too is that something we talked about before is that the other provisions that bar you from holding office seem to be a lot more on its face, like self-evident. Like there, I, we don't have to go yeah. to the Supreme Court to figure out if somebody's thirty-five years old or where they were born. But we could imagine a future if a new hot religion mm -hmm. shows up that counts like ages in the womb or something differently, right? Where you know yeah. when you're born, you're all of a sudden one year old. Where maybe a case does come up where somebody's thirty-five and they were born to some Korean family that believes in counting age in the womb. Where now you actually do have like a Supreme Court decision, and that that's possible, right? We could imagine that that could be the case, right? But for this insurrection thing, I think we all agree, I, right, Pisco, that like the insurrection thing does seem to be, um, if by procedure the same, the question is a bit more complicated. Like reasonable minds could disagree. They couldn't reasonably agree disagree on any other provision. Yeah, 100%, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I agree that it's more complicated. The only thing I'm saying is just imagine Cenk Uger now, right? Who just says he comes up with a legal <laughs> argument for why he's allowed to be on the ballot. Yeah. And he's like, well, I, no, it doesn't apply to me. If, Cause, cause, if you had just like, read one sentence yeah. further, Cenk, in the same yeah. decision you quoted from, that, that but, literally next sentence. I do want to eat crow because as we'll discuss later on at the end, I think now that Cenk Uger is based. Um, and I'll discuss why at the end of this opinion. So you'll have to wait. Why? So because the Supreme the Court might ultimately rule, in which we'll, case they completely we'll, we'll contradict the. Oh, yeah. sure. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. But now I agree. Now I think Cenk should run, and I think he sure. should take it all the way to the Supreme Court. Yeah, um, sure. But, but we'll talk about why uh, later on. But mm -hmm. that being said, there will have to be a determination as to Cenk Uber if he, Uger, if he ever gets far enough where, it's re where it matters, right? There will be a determination that has to be made, even for an obvious principle of constitutional law like yeah. the natural born citizen clause. Yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> the Constitution. Oh, sorry, sorry, last point on that. Oh, yeah, and if no one enforces that, it's meaningless. If there is no mechanism to enforce it, even despite how obvious it is, mm -hmm. then the provision is meaningless. Sure. The Constitution empowers Congress to prescribe how those determinations should be made. The relevant provision is Section 5, which enables Congress, subject, of course, to judicial, to judicial review, to pass appropriate legislation to enforce the 14th Amendment. Um, see City of Bourne v. Flores, I don't know this. Or as Senator Howard put it, at the time the amendment was framed, Section 5 casts upon Congress the responsibility of seeing to it for the future that all the sections of the amendment are carried out in good faith. Oz. So Section 5 has been interpreted by the Supreme Court and was intended to specifically allow Congress to um, enforce its provisions. And so... Alice, could draw, you possibly interpret it? Yeah. That's just what it says. Well, right, hold right, on. Right. Wait, 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 wait. That's not what the court is saying, I don't think. What the court is saying is that Section 3 be shall be enforced exclusively by Section 5. I think they're making a much stronger claim, no? Uh, well, they will for federal positions as we'll get into. Okay. Um, but but to, to be 100,000 trillion percent clear, they're citing case law in which they have recognized a right over and above the, re the regular grants of authority under Article One. We think of Congress as a government of limited powers where mm -hmm. they need to have some specific grant of authority in order to do something. And so they're citing case law which um, recognized a um, additional grant of legislative authority for the purpose of enforcing the 14th Amendment. So that's why they're citing City of Bernie versus Flores. Sure, okay. Um, but it does, just to be clear though, it is saying that like Section 5 isn't just there to enable Congress to pass legislation. They're saying that this seems to be, from my reading of this paragraph, this is the only way by which this can be done. That's what it reads that's like. Not in this paragraph. They're not in this paragraph? The Constitution empowers Congress to prescribe how those determinations should be made. That is how Section 3 determinations should be made. So. To be clear, I think even even people like um, even people like Bod and Paulson would agree that Congress could, if it wanted to, prescribe the rules for how Section Three is determined at le at the very minimum as to federal office holders. I as long as it didn't that. work contrary to the amendment yes, itself. Yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah. I, yes. Uh, um, so my my understanding of what they're saying is not something that even people who agree with me. Uh, would disagree with that Congress could, if it wanted to, mm -hmm. make those uh, rules for. And Congress of the past has. And they have. Yeah, they have multiple. I think multiple times, right? One um, prominent time. And I guess one. We'll, we'll get into the other time um, they allegedly did. Congress's Section 5 power is critical when it comes to Section 3. Indeed, during a debate on enforcement legislation less than a year after ratification, Senator Trumbull noted that notwithstanding Section 3, hundreds of men were holding office in violation of its terms. Um, Cong 
C O N G is short for Congress. Congressman, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, Con Congressional Globe. It's the report. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Congressional Globe, 41st Congress, first session. So, okay. All right. Okay. Um, the Constitution, Trumbull noted, provided no means for enforcing the disqualification, necessitating a bill to give effect to the fundamental law embraced in the Constitution. The enforcement mechanism Trumbull championed was later enacted as part of the Enforcement Act of 1870, pursuant to the power conferred by the section by Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, general building contractors versus Pennsylvania. Any idea what that so, case is about? No, but I do know that what they're citing is the most prominent version of Congress's authority to enact implementing legislation for Section 3, and that is the Enforcement Act of 1870. That act allowed for certain lawsuits to occur for the purpose of enforcing Section 3. And um, this act was later repealed sometime in the 20th century, and no one seems to know why it was repealed. Interesting. Okay. Because there's no, like, debate or discussion about it in Congress. It seems to have been a modernizing situation, and it just kind of dropped off. When they reference yeah. cases in these, if I feel autistic and bored later on, if a case is referenced in the Supreme Court, do you think it's, are they almost always popular cases? Like, no. is it generally speaking, no. or is it, okay. So, like, if I were to go through a case like this, and I'm bored, like, on my flight someplace, if I wanted to go and read through all of the cases that are referenced in the Supreme Court thing, is that a waste could, of time? Yeah. Um, well, Supreme Court very often cites important cases, but not exclusively. I, yeah, so I didn't say exclusively. I'm asking in general, like if cases are cited in Supreme Court decisions, like 60, 70% of the time, are they gonna be famous cases? Or is it like, sometimes they'll cite like famous ones because they're famous, but most of the time it's gonna be like a ton of cases that aren't really that popular. I think they try their best to cite important cases. Okay, all right, just but, so it might be worth looking through some of these. In, in they, more discreet areas of law or new areas of law, they might have only like whatever exists, maybe even just like state trial court decisions on, in certain cases. Okay. And, and Kurt, I don't know, what, what's your take on it? Like when they can, Supreme Court will like cite Marbury every day. Like they'll, oh, sure. they'll, they'll, they'll cite important cases all the time, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Okay. Unless they want something really specific to make specific. a point, in which case you're citing some footnote somewhere. Yeah. Or something oh, for a proposition, so right. which I've seen before. Didn't they do that in um, Dobbs where there was some important yeah. thing they cited a footnote to? And I'm like, dude, you gotta, you gotta do better if this is all you got. You, you have to think, Stephen, if, if they're like citing something, uh, suppose in the abortion debate that they, one of the questions about whether it's a fundamental right has to do with like whether any courts enforced criminal sanctions against abortion in the early or they might cite like a state case some from like yeah, 1780. Exactly. Yeah. Or like gun rights, right? You can think, sure. well, okay. there wasn't a ton of gun cases back in the day. The only thing we have are like these uh, bumfuck decisions from state courts. Sure. Okay. Uh, part B, subsection B, whatever the fuck. <clears throat> this case raises the question whether the states, in addition to Congress, may also enforce section three. We conclude that states may disqualify persons holding or attempting to hold state office, but states have no power under the Constitution to enforce Section 3 with respect to federal offices, especially the presidency. This is, just be clear about what's happening here. Mm -hmm. For everyone who's been following the arguments. And Kurt, you tell me if you disagree, man. The Supreme Court is saying here that Section 3 is self-executing. When I say self-executing, I mean does not require congressional legislation. I don't mean self executing Wait, wait, the court is saying that? With respect to, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna limit it in a second. Oh, okay. The court is saying no. that section three, you can disagree and, and I'll, I'll give you the opportunity. I believe the court is saying that section three is self executing with respect to state positions of government. The reason mm -hmm. I think that is as follows. If congressional legislation were required for state offices and state positions before states could enforce section three, mm -hmm. then those sentences we just read would make no sense. And so therefore the only conclusion can be that with respect to state positions, it is self executing That doesn't mean that all states have to enforce it. it. Doesn't mean that all states don't have their own things to do, but at least with respect to congressional legislation, the court seems to be saying none is required for state enforcement. Kurt, do you disagree? I do disagree. I think the better read of it is that with respect to this, they're saying the 14th Amendment is irrelevant because they say in our federal system, the national government retains only unlimited powers and states and people retain the remainder and the states enjoy sovereign power. So I think what they're actually saying is that this is essentially 10th Amendment. 
that the states enjoy this power regardless of the 14th Amendment. They can disqualify their people for any reason that's not inconsistent with the Constitution. So I think this is actually saying as to the states and what they can do with respect to their own people, the 14th Amendment's irrelevant. I totally, totally disagree. Um, So later on in the opinions we'll get into, they cite instances of states using Section 3 and enforcing it against state legislatures. You have all of this citation to statements sure. made by contemporary Congress people saying, look, we have all these insurrectionists in state legislatures. So I think it would be quite odd that in the context of, of talking about how the, the, the Congress people were bemoaning the Confederates in state legislatures, and mm-hmm. in the context of, of citing um, contemporary uh, disqualifications of state officials, that they're saying Section 3 has no purchase whatsoever for state uh, courts and state officials. Well, there are provisions by, there's a lot of ways to look at this, but cons- the the state constitutions, for example, sometimes grants authorities that the U.S. Constitution does not. Fair. And so they, they say, well, we're just doing this because we want to. It's our idea. We like it. And they can do that. And they, when you read this paragraph, it talks about the national government having only limited powers of states and people retain the remainder. Among the retained power is the power of the state to order the process of its own government. So the retained power, which is the original power, is the power to proceed its own government. So that's ab- that's from the beginning. That's ab initio. That's the, the US Constitution is irrelevant because this is power the state had in the first place before the US Constitution was ever conceived. It talks about the states enjoying sovereign power. That's well, I'll the, have US a con- of, the U.S. Yeah. Constitution is irrelevant to prescribe the manners of their own office and manners of their own elections. So when it comes to what they can do, they can do anything. Now, sure, they can cite Section 3 of the 14th Amendment if they want, but they can just do anything because wait, they're wait, wait, wait. To be clear, just to, to be ultra clear, I'm sorry, because maybe you guys take this for granted, but when you say they do anything, as long as that's not in contravention of... An external part of the Constitution, yeah. Yes. So, yeah. so like, right. they could say, yeah. for instance, like, we don't want this guy on the ballot because his name is Jeffrey, but they couldn't say, we don't want this guy on the ballot because he's black, because that would be in violation of right. federal so law, right? To yeah. the, uh, yeah. other, other, sure except as the U.S. Constitution provides, but they could say, for example, as a matter of their state law, you can't be a state representative unless you're exactly 33 years old. I, they could do it. Okay. Because there's nothing stopping them. Sure. So so here's a here, here's a question for you then. Are you yeah. suggesting that the court is saying, not that you're saying, but the court uh-huh. is saying that states can never enforce section 3 even as to their own officials? I'm I'm saying that they don't have to. They that they they don't yeah, need to. Of they, regardless of whether they have to or whether they need to. The question is, right? Because so, so I'm gonna give you a scenario. Yeah. Let's say that someone uh, under state law, you are allowed to disqualify a state official under Section Three, and they have their own process for Section Three, and it specifically maps on as a state standard Section Three. And uh-huh. in the course of that proceeding, a state uh, supreme court says, under Section Three, we are disqualifying this because under our state laws, and uh, we reference the federal constitution, and um, we think that insurrection means any time you smoke a cigarette. Sure. Do you think the Supreme Court would be able to review that for legal error with respect to Section 3? Not with respect to Section 3, no. Maybe equal protection or something else, but not Section wait, 3. Really? So you think uh, a, a state court... Wait, here, let me pause it really quick, and then you two can... Wait, wait, just real quick. So it sounds like what Uncivil Law is saying, that a state could say, we are going to ban... Um, in reference to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, we're going to ban from the ballot anybody that drinks out of purple bottles. And uncivil law is saying they can refer to whatever they want. It's the state. They've got ultimate authority to do this, and they could do that. It might be a bad legal argument, but would the Supreme Court have review of that decision? I think they would. If you're specifically relying on Section 3 as the source, so the, the, the state law says something like this. We are only enforcing se- the standard as expounded upon in Section 3. <laughs> And under state law, we reference that federal standard. And we're using that federal standard here to disqualify this candidate for this state office. And we find that under Section 3, um, if you drink out of a purple cup, you are an insurrectionist and therefore you're disqualified. You don't think I, I, su- I suppose do if a state was foolish enough to strap themselves that tightly to it, then yes, because it w- you would no longer have an independent basis. You would no longer have a 
in, a sufficient independent, independent basis under state law. So yes, now you would have to go to the then that, then that means that it, even if you grant that ridiculous hypothetical, and I grant you it is ridiculous, but there are other less ridiculous hypotheticals we could come up with. I was just trying to get the most ridiculous one. Then you grant that states may enforce section three, at least some places states can enforce section three by specifically making a mechanism in state law that maps on to this to the congressional or sorry the um the amendment standard that is section three and do they need a congressional enactment to do so and if the answer is wait no, can i pisco can i ask you a quick question on that yeah because i understand what you're saying that it seems to be that they're saying the states can disqualify people um based upon section three for state offices without, but without congressional legislation well, but what about state legislation? Why do we assume that they, when they say that, that they oh, okay. mean- Okay, so, so, so when I say self-execution, self I yeah. don't mean self-execution with respect to state, like, you know, state laws. I'm just talking about self-execution with respect to whether or not it self-executes with or without congressional legislation. There are different- Well, I, well but if you're question, talking about a state, if you're talking about a state law, if it has to, if it requires state legislation, would we still call that self-execution? That's a separate, uh, yeah. So there's multiple, that's a very good question, Stephen. I understand the confusion uh -huh. and the courts and the litigants all acknowledge this difficulty because everyone's like well self-execution does it does that mean that like states don't need to pass laws that's a separate question like state self-execution theories versus sure. okay federal. well here in that yeah. case that doesn't matter then I, I 1 billion percent agree with you then i guess yeah yeah because that, that was the only part that but, i disagreed on yeah. but isn't the entire thesis of the majority opinion that only congress by congressional legislation can create this so As there's nothing federal for, there's nothing positions. there's nothing for, Oh, with respect to wait here, okay. wait, wait, real quick, because you guys are giving good like macro level disagreements of the opinion, but we're like on page six, so we can finish this. Hold these okay. thoughts. If you want, like, write these down in front of you to hold these down, because yeah. a lot of you guys are like borrowing from future paragraphs. Yeah, so let's yeah, get this. Yeah. Okay, but states have no power under the Constitution for Section Three with respect to federal offices, especially the presidency. In our federal system, the national government possesses only limited powers. The states and the people retain the remainder. Quoting from Bond v. United States, among those retained powers is the power of a state to order the processes of its own governance. In particular, the states enjoy sovereign power to prescribe the qualifications of their own officers and the manner of their election, free from external interference, except so far as plainly provided by the Constitution of the United States. Um, as a quick thing, I'm sorry, when it says plainly provided by the Constitution, does Constitution always mean all the Constitution and all amendments that follow? Does it mean Constitution yes. and all federal yes. legislation? Or does it no, just- No, no, no. Okay, so just Constitution just and amendments Constitution. that follow. Okay, yes. Constitution and amendments. Okay, gotcha. Anytime a con the Constitution of the United States is referenced, every following amendment is included in that statement, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, Although the 14th Amendment restricts state power, nothing in it plainly withdraws from the states this traditional authority. And after ratification of the 14th Amendment, states used this authority to disqualify state officers in accordance with state statutes. Look um, at that. So this is saying that states use their authority um, after ratification of the 14th Amendment, not before, to disqualify state offices in accordance with state statutes. So that, that seems to be implying that or I think explicitly saying that you can states can use Section 3 to disqualify state officers in accordance with state statutes. One other point here. The Supreme Court here says, of course, we do, don't suggest that Section 3 impliedly got rid of pre-existing state authorities. Those state authorities, those traditional state authorities are pre-existing. And we're not going to read this provision to overrule them and say that you can't use them in a way of distinguishing state enforcement actions under section three. Here's the problem. One of the traditional under the constitution roles of the state governments and state powers is to assign their electors. That is as fundamental bedrock state power as there can be. States have the authority to assign their electors under the electors clause of article two. So why would you treat the traditional sovereign powers to order your legislatures or offices the way you want to, why would you treat that different than the constitutionally prescribed authority to assign your electors however you want? To me, they should be treated exactly the same. The state authorities inherent to the state to order your government is just as broad as the authority to order your government under, or sorry, to order your electors however you want. They can't violate parts of the constitution, obviously, the way you do it, but they have the authority to set up their government however they want, and they have the authority to assign their electors however they want. How is it not an absolute one-to-one -one between those two authorities, Kurt? 
Yeah, but that's where I sort of get confused because you that sounds a lot like what I was saying, that the states have all the sovereignty that they that exists except for the parts they've given the federal government. So yes, of course they have the in, inherent authority to organize their state governments any way they wish and assign their electors any way they wish, but that power exists. The, the constitution confirms that in some respect, but because the states are the ones giving the federal government power, that power necessarily was the states in the first place. Okay, but then, then it, if you agree that the greater includes the lesser with respect to state governments, why doesn't the greater include the lesser here with assigning your electors? If states are free to apply whatever rules they want to their state governments, why, you know, within the constitutional limits, with uh, uh -huh. equal protection clause, et cetera. Well, I think, why aren't, aren't we- do it with, with aren't, aren't, aren't we they getting, can. wait, aren't we getting to that? Because I think that right now, here's something that I don't understand, and I imagine they're gonna explain it here, or I'll ask you to. It sounds like they're drawing a distinction between state offices and federal offices. And it sounds yes. like that that part is gonna be expanded upon in the next paragraph, because I read a little bit. Yeah, but so, I just wanna, at, at the forefront, explain that I don't see the power of states to organize their own governments as fundamentally less plenary than the power under the constitution to assign electors. I think that they're they're No, I, I agree with you. I'm not sure yeah. I'm not sure what I ever said would imply otherwise. The, oh, I, constitution, I don't think I the constitution says the state shall choose their electors and they can, if they're so inclined, pass a bill that says we're always going to give our state electoral votes to the Republican. Yeah. I mean that's, that's fine. fine. But, yeah. but then what but then we'll get into it, but, but Stephen, keep reading, because okay. there's a part that I, I think. Such power over governance, however, does not extend to federal office holders and candidates. Um, what the fuck? Sorry. Um, okay. Because federal officers owe their existence and functions to the united voice of the whole, not of a portion of the people. Powers over their election and qualifications must be specifically delegated to, rather than reserved by, the states. And they are. The electors yeah. clause specifically delegates to the states the authority to assign their electors. How can you say? That well, I'm not sure I'd agree with delegates, but as much confirms because you can't have a delegation from the federal government back to the states. That doesn't really make sense. Well, well uh, with respect to a federal office like the presidency, they are giving the states the, the role. Where they didn't have the role, you don't have to assume that the, that the states have, at a starting threshold matter, the role to decide who the president is, but the Constitution grants them that authority. And so when they say office holders owe their existence and functions to the united voice of the whole, not a portion of the people, I think what, president, for, yeah. for what on civil law, let me just expand on that. His, his question and then my understanding of what Peace Coast response is in U.S. York. So it sounds like what on civil law is saying is that, like, why would you ever need to delegate? this thing to the states when it, it's, a, it's a law of delegated powers to the federal government, the states are assumed to have everything else. And then the response to that is, well, the reason why you would have to delegate this particular power is because we're not talking about a, a state's right to do something or a state's issue. We're talking about a, the composition of the federal government and electing federal office holders. So the idea that you would just assume that the states have some reserved power insofar as federal government elections are concerned wouldn't necessarily But I don't assume it. I look to the, I, that's a good point, Stephen, but I don't assume it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't assume it. I look to Or no, the, I know that you don't, but I think on yeah. civil law, I think his question, he was saying that like, why would you need to delegate that? Right. Uh, generally, I think that you would need to. Oh, right, right. You yeah. would need to delegate it because a starting assumption would be. I agree with you, Stephen, that the, the the nature of the presidency is a united voice. And by the way, I wish it were like this. I wish you would get rid of the electoral college, and I wish it would be unitary with respect to the president. That's my solemn wish, and I've argued for that before this entire thing came up. So no one can say that I'm inconsistent on that. I wish this wasn't our system, but the truth is, our system is one in which. The Constitution specifically delegates that authority to the state governments. And so I'm not assuming that states have that authority. I'm reading the Constitution and I see it there and it pre exists and predates Section 3. Okay. Do we roughly agree or? Uh, I'm not 100% sure what we're arguing about this point, so let's move on. Okay, sure. Also, I'm just asking questions for, to flesh out my understanding. I don't have a strong position on any of this. I truly don't know the answers to any of this. So, <laughs> okay. Um, Commentaries on the Constitution, okay, that's what they're citing too. But nothing in the Constitution delegates to the states any power to enforce Section 3 against federal office holders and candidates. But why, what delegates them authority to enforce it against state candidates and state factors? Well, they would, it wouldn't need to be delegated regarding yeah, state people. That, that, that would be a reserved argument. power. It's like they don't yeah. need to be delegated. But, 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 it, but they the have point. it from the start. Well, they have the electors clause from the start. 
both are from the start. So here's here's what I don't understand, and the court might be arguing this. I don't. <laughs> I'm never read a constitutional guy. Okay? I don't fucking. Maybe we'll do a con, con law arc on the stream. Okay. It seems like the Constitution, or I'm sorry, it seems like what the argument from the Supreme Court is, is that federal elections are quite a different thing than state elections. These are something that are legally treated in a different manner. And they're arguing that the Constitution hasn't delegated to the states the power to enforce Section 3, um, which it would be required to do if they wanted to use Section 3 to disqualify somebody from a federal election. It's, it feels like it needs an extra delegation there. But Peace Code, it sounds like what your argument is, is no, all of this power has been delegated along with the conference of the electors clause that it would be included with that is what you're saying essentially right so what i'm saying is there's no purpose there's no reason there's no textual basis to say other than to say well they already have the power to control their state governments to say well we treat them differently unless you think that states didn't already have the authority to assign the electors, but of course they do. Yeah, so I, wait, my, like, as a real quick, I feel I, like the question would be like, when it says nothing in the Constitution delegates states any power to enforce section three, what in the Constitution delegates to the states the power to enforce an age limit, and why is that materially different than section boom, three? That would be my question, too. yeah. yeah. 100%, and you'll, what you'll see, and you'll be disappointed, Stephen, they don't even mention it. They don't even try to distinguish it. Do you have a response to that on civil law, or do you understand my question, or? Well, with respect to the age limit, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I haven't specifically considered it, although I would note that, of course, barring the hypotheticals we talked about earlier, this is a much more bright line issue. So Ca yeah, yeah careful. Hold on, wait, 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 wait. One, one really quick thing. Wait, wait, one really quick thing that I want to super stress because a lot of people do this. I don't know. This happens a lot. OK, I think that we have to draw a huge, 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 you know, black box or red circle or whatever the fuck we have to draw a big difference between procedure questions and then questions relating to like the substance of the thing that we're talking about. So mm -hmm. when you say something like it's difficult to answer the insurrection question or whatever, that may or may not be true. I mean, I'm inclined right. to agree with you. It's a difficult question. But right now I'm merely asking because right now saying that nothing in the constitution delegates to the states any power to enforce section three, that is a question purely of procedure. And I'm just asking mm -hmm. like, what by what procedure do the states have the ability to enforce the age restriction or the naturalized citizen restriction? That's a good question. They might not in the first instance in the absence of some sort of specific federal law. I'm not sure anyone's ever raised the issue. But the thing is, Neil Gorsuch agreed that they do. Neil Gorsuch agreed that they do and that states have that authority. And when no did he one, agree to that? Before he was a Supreme Court justice. Okay, well, that but, doesn't matter. That's... But, no, but what I mean to say is it's everyone seems to have an assumption that states are allowed to limit their state ballots for state electors for president to people who are constitute or you know uh, to electors who are um, pledged to candidates only who are qualified to be president and no one seems to doubt their ability to do that in fact no one seems to doubt states abilities to limit ballot access for federal elections to people who get x number of signatures why do states have the power to limit access to their ballots to people who get like 40,000 signatures? It's actually a reasonably good question under U.S. term limits versus Thornton. I think you can make a reasonable argument they can't. But and I don't know the degree to- Everyone has to be let on the ballot? I, I mean, in, in, the absence of, the... in the absence of some sort of federal law, maybe, because again, the DGG federal law to, is by stage of federal. Make, DGG, what they need to do is the next canvassing event is gonna be everyone signing up applications to be on ballots and state, and state things and arguing that constitutionally, states are not allowed to, <laughs> they're not delegated the authority to decide who's on the ballot or not for federal I mean, offices. Pesco, with respect, what I would do is if you say Gorsuch said this, I'd wanna know what his reasoning is because I've disagreed with Gorsuch before, we although he is my favorite on the Supreme Court. It. That's one of the reasons why this opinion, in my opinion, is a travesty. We don't get any good argument for what? Well, no, no, wait. The question was. Well, maybe, the, the, wait, maybe wait. then maybe Gorsuch is wrong. Maybe there's not. Wait, wait, wait. Good actually, argument. wait. Hold on. In re regards to that particular question, I think his question was, or at least my question is, after hearing that, is when did, when did Gorsuch say this? What was the context? The context was there was a uh, a non, um, it's a person who was not born in the United States mm -hmm. who was uh, uh, trying to be on the ballot in Colorado, in mm -hmm. Colorado, the same exact state. Yeah. And he was arguing in court that he wasn't that this was not allowed that he was ineligible for office maybe but you couldn't make him ineligible for the ballot 
And what Gorsuch said is states have a clear and obvious interest in limiting access to the ballot for president for only people who are who are allowed to be on the ballot. In fact, it's a one paragraph opinion. I can I can get it for you right now. Um, oh, OK, to... OK, OK. That's more interesting. Well, okay. I mean, maybe I, I, I mean, maybe Gorsuch just hadn't thought it through. I mean, Gorsuch is a very, very smart guy, but I disagree with him sometimes. I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking about disagreeing with a 9-0 Supreme Court. Maybe Gorsuch made a mistake. Here's, so here's Stephen. I'm yeah, giving it to you in DMs. Mm -hmm. It's oh no, I believe you. I just when you said that, I didn't know if like Gorsuch had just said that in front of like a congressional hearing or as part of his like confirmation. But if he made like an actual ruling, really, that's interesting. I, I would like you to read it. I, I'd like you to bring oh it up. My I think God, it's important. You're gonna make me fucking read. This and maybe it's just fucking. maybe it's just federal common law at this point because maybe everyone's just been relying on the assumptions so long that it's just become part of the federal common law. We're doing nothing but citing cases all the way down. Abdul Kareem is a naturalized. You want me to read this whole thing? Yeah, yeah it's only like it's nothing. Two and a half pages. You're, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, Abdul Kareem Hassan is a naturalized citizen who wishes to run for the presidency of the United States. This, even though the Constitution says, "quote No person except a natural born citizen, ellipsis, shall be eligible for to the office of president." End quote. U.S. Constitutional Article 2, Subsection 1, Clause 5, after the Colorado Secretary of State informed him that his ineligibility for office precluded his placement on the ballot, Mr. Hassan brought this lawsuit asserting that the natural-born citizen requirement and its enforcement through state law barring his access to the ballot violates the citizenship, uh, privileges, and immunities, and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment. The magistrate judge... Argument. Sure. The magistrate judge heard the case on consent of the parties and eventually concluded that the 14th Amendment did not affect the validity of Article 2's distinction between natural born and naturalized citizen. Um, reaching the blah, blah, blah. The yeah, magistrate the judge. Court said that. exactly that. Yeah. The magistrate have, judge granted a summary judgment to defendants and Mr. Hassan appealed. We affirm, and I think we here is, you're saying Gorsuch is writing this opinion. The 10th opinion, Circuit. This the is the 10th, 10th Circuit. Circuit Court of Appeals. Okay. Before Gorsuch, Circuit Judge, uh, Robbery, Senior Circuit Judge. It's a federal court opinion, but yep. it's interpreting okay. actions taken by state actors, the yep. Colorado Secretary In regards to who can be on a ballot. State law. Yeah. yeah. We affirm, we discern no reversible error in the magistrate judge's disposition and see little we might usefully add to the extensive and thoughtful opinion he issued. To be sure, Mr. Hassan contends the magistrate judge overlooked one aspect of his claim. Mr. Hassan insists his challenge to Colorado's enforcement of the natural born citizen requirement did not depend exclusively on invalidation of Article 2 by the 14th Amendment. Even if Article 2 properly holds him ineligible to assume the office of president, Mr. Hassan claims it was still an unlawful act of discrimination for the state to deny him a place on the ballot. But as the magistrate judge judge's opinion makes clear, and we expressly reaffirm here, a state's legitimate interest in protecting the integrity and practical functioning of the political process permits it to exclude from the ballot candidates who are constitutionally prohibited from assuming office. That's a pretty strong opinion. So that's Neil Gorsuch in the 10th Circuit saying, actually, state courts, you do have the power to enforce federal constitutional provisions for candidates for federal office. The but the entire but the entire predicate of the thing is he's raising it on the basis of an equal protection challenge. And equal protection doesn't work because all you're trying to decide at that point is whether the equal protection clause does or does not amend the relevant section in the constitution, which says, for example, natural born citizen. And the, the conclusion is no, it doesn't. Well, wait, wait, wait. I, well, I so understand. Wait, wait. Well, I understand. So you're what, done. Well, what you're saying there might be the case. It feels like at least in Gorsuch's opinion, he goes a bit farther than that because he I does. don't. Yeah, he doesn't just shoot down that equal protections challenge. He says, quote, a state's legitimate interest in protecting the integrity and practical functioning of the political process permits it to exclude from the ballot candidates who are constitutionally prohibited from assuming office, end quote, which goes a little you're, bit you're further than. You're yeah. correct. You're yeah. correct. His, his writing conclusion has is wider in scope and more flourish than the underlying rationale. But if you understand it on the basis of the rationale, then then maybe it's more narrow than it otherwise first appears. I feel I, like I, I understand what you're saying from a layman's perspective, and I, this is a layman challenging a layman's thing. You're not a layman. I didn't mean to imply that. I'm so sorry. Um, what I'm saying is that like if a, like if I was writing an opinion and I was more broad, I might say something because I'm a fucking retard or whatever. But I feel like when courts are ruling, the narrowness or the broadness of the scope of their statements, I feel is something that courts pretty explicitly take into account. No, like when they're ruling on something, they'll be yeah. Go ahead. They, cer they certainly try to, but mm -hmm. as as the Supreme Court itself has noted. The supreme opinions are not to be read like legislation. They're not to be read with the type of. They're they're more um, pro, they're more poetry than prose in some ways. They're more uh, speaking about ideas in in a in a broader sense. So when you read language like that, mm -hmm. 
I think it's reasonable to conclude, for example, well, Gorsuch doesn't really mean that in this, it, it, really as wide as it's written. Do you think that Gorsuch would disavow that and say states have no authority to remove people who are uh, I, 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 not natural citizens from their ballots? That seems to be an assumption of every single court who has faced that issue. Here's what I think. I think the question that you ask in law is often substantially more important than the answer because the question drives the analysis. So if the question is, hey, is this an equal protection problem? Because maybe the equal protection clause amended the section of the constitution requiring you to be a natural born citizen. And the answer is no, it doesn't do that. Maybe if you asked a different question, you'd get a different answer. Hey, hey, this is a powers question. So the powers question is as follows. Yeah. Can the state of Colorado exclude someone from the ballot who is ineligible under the Constitution for holding office. And what Hassan says is, hey, um, the Equal Protection Clause got rid of this provision, but that doesn't decide the issue about whether, even if it did, he's eligible to be on the ballot or whether Colorado can exclude him. And what Neil Gorsuch explicitly says is that yes, Colorado can apply the federal constitutional provision for a federal office, the states are allowed to do that. But where well, where was it derived in Article Two that states were delegated the authority to enforce that provision? Yeah, I well, guess my question I don't is think he was, and that's why I'm that's why I'm critiquing Gorsuch. Well, even if you're critiquing and Gorsuch, I'm also trying to understand it in the context of which he gave the answer. If you're critiquing Gorsuch, it's a parade of absurdities. Uh, not you, not you, but the the result of it. I, I like you a lot, Kurt. But the Thank result you. of it is a parade of absurdities because then it would seem to imply, well, states can't put any substantive restriction on who's on the ballot in the, for federal office. Why could they? Yeah, I guess well, my I mean, question is that's, that's sort of that's okay. sort of what U.S. versus term limits seems to suggest exactly that because in I term limits term they were that far. really okay. I, I mean, term then, limits we, about Article One and about the requirements for for um, congressional office holders. It We're is by its own office. terms, but it basically says, look, the Constitution, when it comes to members of the House or members of the Senate, sets out the criteria. If you want to be a member of the House, you have to be 25 years old, you have to have lived in the United States seven years, you have to be from the district. If you want to be a member of the Senate, 39 years, and but so forth and so on. Okay, so wait, wait, okay, can I just, let me just it's ask, right let me ask questions to this guy this, okay? Because this is, be, this is, Okay, firstly, I want to I wanna reiterate this a billion times, okay, because it seems really, really, really hard, or I'm being too overconfident myself or whatever, but it feels like a lot of people are very tied into the idea that what is an insurrection and who participated? That's a challenging question, and I would say, uh, I don't know if Pisco agrees, but I would say reasonable minds can disagree on a lot of questions related to what does it mean to give aid or comfort? What does it mean for it to be an insurrection? Like, I think reasonable minds can disagree there, but I feel like because of the disagreement there, somehow that infects everything else such that we get statements like, but nothing in the Constitution delegates to the states any power to enforce Section 3 against federal office holders and candidates. So then here's my like law question, okay? And you guys know this way better than I do, but so just reading from the Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, Clause 5, no person except a natural born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this Constitution shall be eligible to the office of president, neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained an age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. Why not, uh, somebody gets disqualified then from being on the ballot for that, why not that case go before the Supreme Court and then somebody says, but nothing in the Constitution delegates to the states any power to enforce Article 2, uh, mm -hmm. Section 1, Clause 5 against federal office holders and candidates. Or, and then I one other part, one argument. other, well, yeah, and then one other quick part uh, on the same vein, looking at the 22nd Amendment, because I just, I looked up the wording of this, it says, Section 1, no person shall be elected to the office of the president more than twice, and no person who has held the office of president or acted as president for more than two years of a term uh, to which some other person was elected president shall be elected to the office of the president more than once. And then it would be the same question for there. Well, what yeah. in the Constitution delegates to the states the power to enforce, to enforce uh, the 22nd Amendment? I don't understand what the answer to that could possibly be. There is no good answer. How do you distinguish it? Um, uh, yeah, there, there, there maybe there is no good answer. And so maybe the answer, try. maybe the answer is, but maybe the answer is you don't distinguish. But I mean, that's, that's one that's one resolution to the problem. If that's I mean, at least answer, to at least to the situation when states can't do anything yes. and you're leaving it up to the feds. So you'd have to go sue in federal court as opposed to state court. Be like, hey, that guy's not natural born. But, you know, yeah, but yeah, maybe but, but that's as, the right answer. As we know from like a lot of case law, that the, the courts usually are reluctant to apply some kind of implied right of action. Why can you sue? a state official who refuses to put you on the ballot, or let's say uh, a candidate or, or sue anybody who has the power uh -huh. to, to make these determinations. 
what gives you a federal cause of action to sue over that? Or, oh my God, question? this is such a good, stupid fucking question. I would love to see it argued amongst Supreme Court justices. Um, the year is 2025, and we have figured <laughs> out how to resurrect people from the dead. We oh. resurrect a Confederate soldier, and he goes to run for office, and a state says, I'm sorry, we're going to kick you off due to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Would a state uh -huh. be allowed to disbar an old Confederate soldier who took an oath, who was an officer, uh -huh. we'll say he was a judge or whatever, from running for the ballot? Because under this, uh -huh. it's saying essentially, no, you can't. Oh, yeah. If you're resurrected from the dead, are you still natural born? Uh, as long as you're resurrected on U.S. Yeah. soil, yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll say that you're resurrected on U.S. Not, soil. Is Frankenstein's monster natural born? I don't know, man. But but there's no... I, I, I love you, and I mean that. I mean that I love you. But there's no good answer to this, in my opinion. Now, you could say, well, this is an easier or harder determination. That's one way you could try to slice it. I appreciate that. I appreciate it's not a satisfactory answer to the well, underlying, well, why can they make the determination at all? If the ease or hardness of it doesn't really speak to who, who can make the decision. But yeah, you're right to come out and play bullshit on yeah, that. But, that's fine. That, that, that's a powers question. And I, I, I'm i just so disappointed that the court does not seriously deal with it. And for U.S. term limits, one way you – the thing, the obvious way I think you distinguish that is, well, Congress people are not uh, sort of as, as an office or as a position given to the states to, to decide, right? Because of the – uh, Article One, and then the later amendment with respect to the direct election of senators, mm -hmm. we now know that states cannot just decide who is and who is not a senator or congressperson. That goes to the people. That's mm -hmm. not true of the president. It's still the case that the presidential electors clause is in force. And so unlike Congress people, where there is no direct state um, election of these candidates, there is direct yeah, well, any time we want to repeal the, uh, what is it, the 19th Amendment for uh, senators? For senators. Seven, but, seven, but, or is it the 17th? Yeah, no, no, that's a good point. Any time we want to repeal the 17th Amendment, we'll be just fine. That's another me. great point. Uh, <laughs> if we were to repeal that, now state legislatures would be specifically empowered to decide who is and who is not a senator. But this yeah. opinion would still render it such that they couldn't enforce Section 3 as to officers, or sorry, sorry members of, of Congress with whom they are given explicit grants of authority to elect. How I can think, that be if we're taking on the on good word that they're allowed to, to enforce it as the state officials? And I think it's also disappointing, um, this is a big criticism, I have a lot of UN shit actually, is that there isn't even like a really like an argumentation that's engaged in here. It's just kind of like stated and then you just kind of take it as is and then go. But I guess they consider that's not a controversial question, but um, yeah. And by the way, this is true of <laughs> every single member of the court. So 9-0, they've decided that states cannot enforce it as to federal office holders for Section 3. Well, So yeah. every single member of, of the Supreme Court agrees oh. with that holding. Wait, hold on. To be clear, mm -hmm. and this might be a spoiler alert because you've read, it would be possible that somebody could have agreed with the, uh, the operative holding. I don't even know what the operative holding would be. They could have agreed with this case but had said in their like opinion, their concurring opinion or whatever the fuck, like, well, but I don't agree with this. Oh, every section, one right? of them has explicitly. Every one of them agrees yeah, on this the, point. Okay, on this well, point. then you guys are just spoiling because we I haven't read all that yet. So oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah. Good. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, but because now you have the now that you have the precedent that states do not have the power to enforce section three, why do they have the power to enforce Article One? Yeah. And maybe they don't. So, hey, you've got new precedent for your new constitutional challenge. Exciting. So, Cenk Uger, or for Obama, Or for Barack Obama to run for another term, right? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And, and then the question would be like, well, you need federal legislation to enforce it. Well, what if Congress is like, no, we don't want to do that, just yeah. like they're going to do for Section 3? Mm -hmm. Well, then what? Well, I mean, where, where's the problem? And I now am saying Cenk Uger... <laughs> I, uh, this is a... Uh, maybe, maybe I'll think about this for a week or a few days. But yeah. I want to see an opinion by the Supreme Court to distinguish it. Thank you, Go to the Supreme Court. I'm sorry that I called you out. It was a big mistake, I think. Yeah. Anyway. Um, just to get the, the, the ruling on it, yeah. Um, as an initial matter, not even the respondents contend that the Constitution authorizes states to somehow remove sitting federal office holders who may be violating Section 3. Um, respondents contend. Okay, that's obviously true. Such a power would flout the principle that the Constitution guarantees the entire independence of the general government from any control by the respective states. 
Indeed, consistent with that principle, states like even the lesser powers to issue writs of man, uh, mandamus, mandamus, how do you pronounce mandamus. it? Mandamus. Mandamus yeah. against federal officials or to grant habeas corpus relief to persons in federal custody. But none of that is inconsistent with our position. So we all agree that states can't like you can't recall your senator yeah. because they never had that power. Of course, but states do have the power to assign electors. And so obviously they can't unseat people or issue writs of mandamus to, to federal officials, but they are allowed to assign electors. And so bringing up some power that no one thinks that states have in general um, isn't a good counter argument to a power that they do. To be fair, they say like as an initial matter, not even the respondents contend this. So nobody yeah. is saying this. So that's fine. The respondents nonetheless maintain that states may enforce Section 3 against candidates for federal office. But the text of the 14th Amendment on its face does not affirmatively delegate such a power to the states. The terms of the amendment speak only to enforcement by Congress, which enjoys power to enforce the amendment through legislation pursuant to Section 5. This is where my other question then again would for, be for the 22nd Amendment. Am I missing? Is there some other text of this, or because I don't know how does the because how does the twenty second amendment confer onto states that you can block somebody if they've been a two term president? Good question. Good question. Um. Yeah, I don't understand. I don't understand the or the statements there, but okay. The response. Um. The kind of little force. Okay. <clears throat> this can hardly come as a surprise. <laughs> Given that the substantive provisions of the amendments embody significant limitations on state authority, under the amendment, states cannot abridge privileges or immunities, deprive persons of life, liberty, or property without due process, deny equal protections, or deny male inhabitants the right to vote. I think this is a little more, this is more, I think, a little bit sneaky, because included with the restriction on abridging privileges or immunities, the restriction on depriving persons of life and liberty or property is a implied restriction on putting forth candidates who were previous oath takers. And just like with the privileges or immunities clause, the equal protection clause, the substantive due pro sorry, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, states are impliedly given uh, or supposed to have authorities or at least have pre-existing authorities to enforce those provisions. So just like states have pre-existing sovereign authorities to enforce the requirements of the Equal Protection Clause, states have pre-existing sovereign authorities to enforce Section 3 via the Electors Clause. And so there is no difference here. Yes, it's a restriction, but they're all kind of restrictions. The, the, the states are not allowed to put forth certain candidates for, for office who are previous oath takers and, and oath breakers. And so I don't really see how this is at all convincing. They're all restrictions. Even I also, Section 3. the loading of the wordage too, like this can hardly come as a surprise given the substantive provisions of the amendment quote embody significant limitations on state authority end quote we're not talking about an executive action and we're not even talking about law passed by congress we're talking about an amendment to the constitution so the idea that like wow an amendment to the constitution might significantly alter some provision for how you know society is governed i think is kind of a silly like obviously amendments can significantly change a lot of things um also, I don't know, I, I haven't heard a convincing argument that if you were a prior oath taker, you've engaged in something, section three counts as an insurrection, now you can't run for office again, that that counts as a deprivation of life, liberty, or property without due process or something like that. Like, I don't know if you have, if it's ever granted that you've got like the right to run for office or having that right to revoke is like some substantial injury against a person and only prior oath takers too, but I don't know. Um, Okay, keep reading. On the other hand, the 14th Amendment grants new power to Congress to enforce the provisions of the amendment against the states. It would be incongruous, uh, in, incongruous? In Congress. In Congress, okay. It would be incongruous to read this particular amendment as granting the states the power, silently no less, to disqualify a candidate for federal office. Well, it's not silently granting them the power. They've been granted by words of the amendment and, yeah, I don't know. In Article 2, uh, with yeah. respect to president. Yeah. Now, and, and because remember, they... Everyone agrees, it seems, right, that Section 3 granted states the power to disqualify mm. state candidates under Section 3. Yeah, they have yeah, that yeah. authority, right, with or without yeah. congressional action. And so why would that be any different than the presidential electors? There's no good response to that. Do you, here's like a question. If you were to take Section 5 and add it on to like the 22nd Amendment, or if you were to delete Section 5, would that significantly change the legal analysis then? Like let's say for section uh, five, it yeah, said, no. let's say that for the it 22nd could, amendment, yeah. um, it says that uh, Congress shall have the power to enforce this term limit restriction by legislation. Does that mean that if Congress makes no legislation that the 22nd amendment is essentially dead or? 
I mean, I mean, possibly, and I would also just point to like Article One, Section Eight, for example, which just enumerates all of Congress's power. Congress has the power to do all kinds of stuff, but they're not required to. I mean, Congress can just not do things. That's always an option. Yeah, but I think the strong argument for this amendment was that the, the same. The argument that you just said that like, co- like if Congress wants to pass legislation relating to Section Three, then they have the op- they can Congress um, can pass legislation relating to it, but they're not required to. And them doing it or not doesn't change whether or not Section Three is in effect. Like if Congress doesn't enact their uh, legislative things granted to them by Section Five, it doesn't mean that Section Three disappears or it's not already part of law. It just means that Congress hasn't made law relating to it. But, um, okay, it would be in, uh, in Congress, okay. The only other plausible constitutional sources of such a delegation are the elections and electors clauses, which authorize states to conduct and regulate congressional and presidential elections, respectively. Um, see Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1, blah, 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 okay. But there is go little- to the, Go to the footnote. Okay. Um, the elections- Oh, wait, never mind. That just explains what those are. Never mind. Yeah. Um, but there is little reason to think that these clauses implicitly authorize the states to enforce Section 3 against federal office holders and candidates. Granting the states that authority would invert the 14th Amendment's rebalancing of federal and state power. Again, no no, no dealing with like Article 2 or the Electors Clause, just saying generally the purpose of the 14th Amendment was to reduce state authority. Mm-hmm. And so generally, we're not going to read it to give state more power. But of course, you could read this as as giving states more authority the way they're reading it now. It's it's depriving them of the responsibility to enforce Section 3. And so I, I really don't see why the court does not engage with the argument from the Elector's Clause that's just like state government power to organize their governments however they want, states have the authority to assign the electors however they want. I, I don't also, see a way around that, and they don't even try to ag- yeah. address it, really. And also, the amendment has in it a provision for the federal body of Congress to override the state decision as well, mm-hmm. right? Because there is a yep. specific relief granted by this amendment. So in terms of, like, rebalancing federal and state mm-hmm. power, like, a state can say, like, oh, well, we don't think Trump is here. And, and Congress can vote and say, well, actually, we are going to give which they have in the past legislatively, right? We're going to grant some relief of the Section 3 thing sure. for January 6th or whatever, right? Yeah. Mm. The text of Section 3 reinforces these conclusions. Its final sentence empowers Congress to remove any Section 3 disability by a two-thirds vote of each House. The text imposes no limits on that power, and Congress may exercise it at any time as the respondents concede. See brief for respondents 50. In fact, historically, Congress sometimes exercised this amnesty power post election to ensure that some of the states or some of the people's chosen candidates could take office. But if states were free to enforce Section 3 by barring candidates from running in the first place, Congress would be forced to exercise its disability removal power before voting begins if it wished for its decision to have any effect on the current election cycle. I don't know what the point of that that's is at all. It's not very convincing either. I mean, yeah. what you're saying is is essentially it could be inconvenient for Congress to to do that. And that's, that's literally, like, that is literally what is happening right now, right? Yeah. We're going through, we got something, oh, we didn't even, this is past Congress. We got something all the way to the Supreme Court relating to a qualification of a ballot in a, in a month, in a yeah. couple months, how long? Yeah. So the idea that like, this month. yeah, um, or no, I'm trying to think of like when this case was originally filed. I guess it was some months ago, to be fair, 2023. Um but 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 the thing is like even even further than that like the other ratchet is that you never litigate these claims ever before um so like you, uh, sorry you never litigate these claims at all and section 3 becomes a dead letter you understand like if if it's the case that it's so inconvenient to ever have congressional action for the the removal of disqualification parts for congress um, and you're going to read everything in terms of not applying it before the election, what you're doing is you're essentially making Section 3 a dead letter unless well, that's, Congress gets its act together. Yeah, well, that's literally what the court's argument is. is section 5 yeah. means Section 3 is dead until a law is passed to enforce it, basically. Yeah, so Congress yeah, I don't really, I, I don't really like yeah. that. I don't really like that idea of dead letter. Again, just because Congress isn't doing something doesn't stop them from being able to. If Congress doesn't want to have post offices, they can create them tomorrow. I mean, they don't have to. Yeah, they don't I have guess. to exercise power. Yeah, but we don't think of that with any other part of the Fourteenth Amendment. We don't think of that with the Equal Protection Clause or with the Due Process Clause. We don't think like, well, Congress could choose if it wanted to not to enforce 
Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, and they, but they have the power to. No other part of the 14th Amendment is treated this way. And you have to think, like, what is the basis for that? Well, one is rights giving, one is right, rights taking away. Like, well, what's going on here? Um, so I, I really don't see a way to, to square this different treatment of 14th Amendment constitutional provisions in any convincing way. Well, I, I mean, I just, there's all kinds of pragmatic concerns because... That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's all kinds of issues because it's so unlitigated and we don't, obviously it was referring to the Civil War, but what else is it referring to? I, the one it's thing, problematic. The one thing that I would be very, very cautious there, and I think that there are very progressive, very liberal courts that could use the pragmatic concern, but it feels like, and I'm going very outside of the court in particular, and I don't know what their prior rulings have been, but it feels like when you argue with people about, say, firearms, if you bring up the fact that the Second Amendment was created at a time when we were using musket balls or muskets mm -hmm. with like fucking the, mm -hmm. yeah, whatever. Well, obviously the founders intended for us also to have, you know, AR-15s and M4s and all these other things that we want. And it's like, okay, well, hold on. Did they actually mean that? And it's like, well, we just have to go by the strict reading of it. Like Congress shall make no law abridging, you know, blah, blah, and that's it, boom. Whether it's inconvenient and or And there not. is no, or at least when I hear conservatives argue about it, and maybe in the Supreme Court, maybe in their decisions that they've written, maybe they do deal with these things and I just haven't read them, that's possible. But I don't hear the arguments of practicality ever brought up in regards to the Second Amendment, ever. There's never a pragmatic argument. It feels like that's like a hard line textual. I, 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 you know. I don't know about that, to be uh -huh. quite honest. I mean, the, sec this, the First Amendment, by contrast, usually gets a couple cases every year. The Second Amendment gets no love. I mean, they've, they've had, what, three major cases since Bruin 2007? Wait, what? Wait, no, that, that no, no, I mean, no, it, it's, it's, it's not- love letters. No, I, I just disagree fundamentally here. It's like, look, the First Amendment has three, five cases every single year. And it's had um, ever since, what, the 1940s when the, uh, when the Supreme Court decided the First Amendment existed? Mm -hmm. And ever since then, they've been having cases. So you have such a body of case law trying to figure out this thing. And the, I the don't Supreme understand how Court, Stephen's point. Uh, Stephen's point is that no, I, but my no, look, this, the, the, no, the, the, we're talking about the pragmatic concern. Yeah, yeah. and the reason this, at least mm -hmm. part well, of the reason, is Supreme Court's not taking these cases on cert is because they don't want to deal with the pragmatic issues. So they're just content to let everything flail around. So I think the Second Amendment is actually not as bad an analogy as you might have suggested. I feel like You're it's a bit different though, real quick, because when we take, take out like First Amendment challenges, I think the, it's not generally just like a pragmatic concern. Like there's a lot of criminal law and everything built in that I think all of us agree have clear restrictions on your freedom of speech, right? Like I can't plan to do a crime with somebody. I think universally we all agree that that wouldn't be protected speech, conspiracy to commit crimes. So I feel like it's it's not just a matter of pragmatic concerns. It's also balancing out like criminal law and everything else. Um, whereas for, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, please go say something. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree that just because the court is because of pragmatics not taking cases, that yeah, they'll, they'll oftentimes try to avoid cases. Although not this, this court seems to be trying to take every controversial case it possibly can, uh, just, just to be clear. Um, but in terms of the rationale of the opinions, Try to catch Alito or Thomas ever saying in any other context, like, well, it's inconvenient for us to have this thing called the First or Second Amendment. Well, Alito actually might with the First Amendment, um, but mm -hmm. with respect to the Second Amendment, um, like, imagine being like, it's inconvenient to have the Second Amendment. Like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really see that. Or, or Scalia being like, it's inconvenient to force cops to uh, get warrants to do these thermal imaging scans of, of homes. That would have zero purchase. Uh, the whole point of the Constitution, in a way, is to be inconvenient. It's a restriction on the impulses mm. of democracy, just like Section 3 is. Yeah. Okay. Um, perhaps a state may sure. burden congressional... Justice, Steve yeah. Justice Stevens would might write that the Second Amendment's really inconvenient. Sure. Yeah. Perhaps a state may burden congressional authority in such a way when it exercises its exclusive sovereign power over its own state offices... Um, but it is implausible to suppose that the Constitution affirmatively delegated to the states the authority to impose such a burden on congressional power with respect to candidates for federal office. But, but no, what citation needed? Like, it's implausible because... Because why? Because of McCulloch v. Maryland? Because, yeah, we, we know that states can't... Like, well, it sounds like because it's better. burdensome, it's just a pragmatic yeah, argument, yeah, but like, basically, yeah. But, but we know that states can't intrude on federal areas of like exclusive jurisdiction, whatever. But that presupposes that Congress has an area or the federal government has exclusive jurisdiction somewhere or has super I, I think, jurisdiction somewhere. 
I think they're speaking that it's implausible specifically with respect to the 14th Amendment, because as you noted earlier, the point of the 14th Amendment was to take power away from fed uh, from the states. So it'd be a little implausible to take power away from the states and be like, oh, by the way, states, here's a here's a way you can directly interfere with federal officers and federal elections. That doesn't sound like something they were trying to do. do well, but actually, now. well, so here's a really interesting question. Or maybe it's not interesting, but here's this is something that I would wonder. It sounds like it's possible as I, maybe this isn't be true. It sounds like it's possible that Congress could pass a law saying, hey, we're passing a law saying that you are indeed allowed to restrict somebody from the ballot if they meet this section three requirement. It sounds like that very law could be challenged as and then ruled as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court because of all the argumentation laid out in this paragraph that it's it would be incredibly burdensome. Um, that why would you? If Congress get them does it, yeah. If Congress made that oh, law, no, if Congress does it, I think they're they're thrilled mm -hmm. because Congress has exerted their power. I don't think they care anymore. Yeah, but it feels like the same arguments that you're making against it could essentially be used to challenge that very law by Section Three in the first place. And then you could say, well, that law is unconstitutional because, like, look, uh, now now if Congress passed that law and and now you are, um, and now you remove somebody from a ballot. Congress has is forced to exercise your disability removal power before voting even begins, if it wished for its decision to have an effect on the current election cycle. Like that argument would still hold true for that law. Um, yeah, but it's Congress doing it, which the Constitution just said they can. Okay. So that's cool. <clears throat> okay. Do you want to? Can I keep reading? Yeah, yeah. sure. States have no power, or quote, states have no power to, imp to retard, impede, burden, or in any manner control the operations of the constitutional laws enacted by Congress. So that's quote. McCulloch v. Maryland. That's a very, so in your list of cases that are very famous, that's a very famous case uh, regarding in, in ways the, the supremacy of federal law. There was a national bank that a state was trying to um, tax and I think the court, I think there's a Marshall opinion, right? Uh, famously says mm -hmm. the power to tax is the power to destroy. And they're saying, States, you don't have an authority to to tax this federal instrument. You you, you don't have a, an ability to impede burden um, parts of the federal constitutional scheme, and I agree with that. Um, except you need to establish at first principles that states have no role here. Um, so it seems circular in a way, it's, or it's begging the question. The question is, do states have a role? No one disagrees that if states do not have a role, they can't oust the federal government. But my contention is that they do have a role. They have a role because they have the inherent authority to assign their electors, at least for presidential elections. Okay. Nor have the respondents identified any tradition of state enforcement of Section 3 against federal office holders or candidates in the years following ratification of the 14th Amendment. Such a lack of historical precedent is generally a, quote, telling indication, end quote, of a, quote, severe constitutional problem, end quote, with the asserted power. This is complete bullshit, in my opinion, in many ways. Number one, there are very good reasons why um, there was no enforcement as to federal um, federal office holders or positions. And they have to do with how the elections were run generally um, and the, the fact that it was very quickly given amnesty and all that stuff and that Congress was using its authorities under other uh, powers it has just to not seat people. So there was, and, and because people were just not going for offices. So there's a ton of reasons practically why there wouldn't be a ton of case law of, of state enforcement as to federal. That's true, for sure. But there are many constitutional provisions that are not enforced correctly or that, are, that are, there haven't been enforced for years. And it takes the Supreme Court stepping up and acknowledging that it was wrong. So to give you an example, the Second Amendment was never applied to states and state governments until the 21st century in 2009 or 10. When, whenever mm -hmm. uh, McDonald came out. That's just mm -hmm. true. For hundreds of years, not uh, <laughs> exaggerating, for hundreds of years, no one thought the Second Amendment applied to state governments. And there was no contemporary practice of the Second Amendment being applied as to state governments. Even after the, the ratification of the, of the 14th Amendment, there was no practice of the Second Amendment being applied to, to state governments. And so, when there's good explanations for why it was that states didn't enforce against federal officers, and when there's many other provisions of the Constitution which were not applied or, in, or applied incorrectly, as in the, in the case of uh, Plessy v. Ferguson, when the 14th Amendment wasn't, when the Supreme Court did not adhere to what the true meaning of the Constitution meant, um, the Supreme Court has stepped in and attempted to fix that 
that problem, but they're not doing so here. Okay, I'm gonna keep reading. And it is an especially telling sign here because as noted, states did disqualify persons from holding state offices following ratification of the 14th Amendment. That pattern of disqualification with respect to state but not federal offices provides persuasive evidence of a general understanding that the states lacked enforcement power with respect to the latter. This goes to your point that it seems then that what they're suggesting is that states did have enforcement power with respect to the former. That is, states can enforce Section 3 against state officials. And that would go to my point that what the court is holding is that Section 3 is self-executing, but only with respect to state positions. And what was their argument for that? Because there's just not, be oh, because there's not a thing in the Constitution that delegates Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the... To states for federal officers. But, sure, but where is the part which delegates it to, of to state officers? Yeah. I mean, we're just looping at this point, but yeah. there is no part of the Constitution which also delegates enforcement of section three to state officials and so why would we read it in and the response to that is well they have this pre-existing authority and my response to this is well states have the pre-existing authority For the electors clause the electors clause right? yeah okay instead it is congress that has long given effect to section three with respect to would-be or existing federal office holders shortly after ratification of the amendment congress enacted the enforcement act of 1870 that act authorized federal district attorneys to bring civil actions in federal court to remove anyone holding non-legislative office federal or state in violation of section three and made holding or attempting to hold office in violation of section three a federal crime um, subsection blah, blah, blah. In the years following ratification, the House and Senate exercised their unique powers under Article 1 to adjudicate challenges contending that certain prospective or sitting members could not take or retain their seats due to Section 3. And the Confiscation Act of 1862, which predated Section 3, effectively provided an additional procedure for enforcing disqualification. That law made engaging in insurrection or rebellion, among other acts, a federal crime punishable by disqualification from holding office under the United States. A successor to those provisions remains on the books today. See 18 USC 2383. Okay, so now we're going to talk about this, the the meme of you need a criminal c conviction mm -hmm. and 18 USC. Well, because it's all that's left. That's the thing. I mean, you don't strictly speaking need it in the first instance. If Congress gave a law where you know a U.S. prosecutor can file a civil case, then sure. But this is Think all that's about left. How ridiculous this is, Kurt. What do you want from me? Congress no, no, didn't pass no. the I, law. I, wanted, that was I, 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 I just want to make the simple point. The Confiscation Act was passed in 1862. Okay. That's years before Section 3. And Super. so to pretend, to pretend that, that, that 18 U.S.C. 2383 was, or uh, it, basically it's been codified in that section, but it's, it's essentially, it's the same section. To pretend that this act was enforcing a provision that didn't even exist yet. That can't be the case. And, and they're citing it for support of their position. They're saying this statute, which was passed before Section 3, enforces Section 3. That a, we've a never successor interpreted. successor to the provision, right? No, but that provision, it remains on the books. That, so, so what was passed was the Confiscation Act, and that has not changed. And I don't believe it's been reenacted. I think it's been reenacted. I think it's been reorganized into 18 U.S.C. 2383. But what they're saying is, that this section, which which gets like its language from 1862, that that was a manner to enforce disqualification. It wasn't like this was this statute was reauthorized or repassed. Well, you know, Congress does pass unconstitutional law sometimes, so maybe it was unconstitutional. And that's why Congress thought, you know, maybe we should make it a constitutional amendment so we have clear power. But, but what I'm saying is, the court when the court says that this statute, which was an, originally enacted before section three is a manner to enforce section three. And you can tell so because, I, I don't know, um, I actually don't know. Like, how can it be the case that a statute which predates a constitutional provision by a manner of years is a manner I don't to know what the Confiscation Act of 1862 says, so I'm gonna have to plead ignorance on this one. So it's, it's, it's the criminal statute for insurrection. Even though they say it's a successor to the provision, so it's literally the same thing? It's essentially the same thing. I think it's been reorganized, but I don't think the language has changed. And I don't okay. think it, it hasn't been like explicitly reauthorized. It's it's the same language on the books. Um, okay. I don't know. Okay. You got me. Maybe Congress passed it and they're like, you know, we should really have some explicit authority. So they 
they ratified the statute by the constitutional amendment. But they know that there's no there's no evidence of that. There's no de- there's no like evidence that people were like, huh, we're reauthorizing this in 19 whatever so that we can enforce section three because this provision doesn't like there's just simply no evidence of the intention of anybody in in the organizational um, shuffling of the confiscation act that what was intended was to um, enforce section three. But they're perfectly willing to say that's a manner to enforce it today because they don't want to they don't want to say that there's no way. Uh, All right. I, I don't know. I'm going to have to go read the Confiscation Act, I guess. Sure. Okay. I'll get back to you. <clears throat> Moreover, permitting state enforcement of Section 3 against federal office holders and candidates would raise serious questions about the scope of that power. Section 5 limits congressional legislation enforcing Section 3 because Section 5 is strictly remedial. Uh, to comply uh, to comply with that limitation, Congress must tailor its legislative scheme to remedying or preventing the specific conduct the relevant provision prohibits. Section 3, unlike other provisions of the 14th Amendment, prescri- proscribes conduct of individuals. It bars persons from holding office after taking a qualifying oath and then engaging in insurrection or rebellion, nothing more. Any congressional legislation enforcing Section 3 must, like the Enforcement Act of 1870 and... Uh, the section 2383 reflect congruence and proportionality between preventing or remedying that conduct and the means adopted to that end. Um, Neither we nor the respondents are aware of any other legislation by Congress to enforce section three. Pause. Yeah. The court here is just pondering. The court here is just pondering and dis and engaging in some advisory opinions about issues that are not before them. The issue before them that could have decided the case is states can't enforce, period, end of day. What they're saying now, even though it's not before them, is that Congress is needed to enact Section 3 for federal positions. Yeah. Even so, though it's not... I mean, this, this is where the dissent and uh, Sotomayor criticizes, and I think makes a reasonable point it's not necessary well amy coney barrett wasn't she came out from other reasons um but well no 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 well no spoilers but we'll we'll see it yeah so i mean i i suppose you could argue if you're so inclined this is dicta well but then why is the court do why is the court doing this why is the the why is the supreme court pontificating man they make hamlet look uh decisive (laughs) it's this issue is not before them the issue about whether other kinds of federal enforcement or whether Congress is the exclusive means, that is not before them. What's before them is whether states can enforce it. That's what's before them. And the the court is taking this opportunity to write this opinion because they want to carve out any other challenge through any other federal court system. And they want to do that here, even though it's not before them and it's not been briefed significantly. Well, any state system, to be sure. And I, I think that's exactly what they're trying to do, because, you know, this is the criticism that Sotomayor has, and she has a point. You know, they're trying to speak to issues beyond this, and it's an issue of, like, how far beyond the immediate issues should you decide to deal with issues in the future. And Roberts apparently wants to go a little bit further and try to nip some of this in the bud so they don't have to do this again anytime in the near future. So That's supposed you know. to be improper. That's not. That's supposed to be something that courts don't do. Courts are not supposed eh. to give advisory opinions for stuff that's not before them. But, but I don't know if strictly speaking, if, well, I mean, it there is a case in controversy. It is, advisory. So they, Hang on. It, it is advisory. The other issue that decides the case is the first part that says state states can't enforce this. They don't need to pontificate on other federal remedies, but they do anyway. Keep continuing reading. I mean, or oh, go ahead. I, I, again, also, just I, a heads up, I've got like 40, dicta, I guess. I've got about 40 minutes, so we're about halfway right. through, just a heads up. Okay, yeah. yeah. Any state enforcements of Section 3 against federal office holders and candidates, though, would not derive from Section 5, which confers power only on the Congress. As a result, such state enforcement might be argued to sweep more broadly than congressional enforcement could under other precedents, or I'm sorry, under our precedents. But the notion that the Constitution grants the states freer reign than Congress to decide how Section 3 should be enforced with respect to federal offices is simply implausible. And and then again, I'm just curious, like, because isn't that already the case? Like, does Congress decide if a president can't be listed on a ballot due to age or term limits or anything else? Like, don't the states already have more authority or? 
That's what I thought. That seemed to be an assumption of Gorsuch and uh, in the Hassan case. Yeah, that's I don't understand that because cause, yeah, because because so, it feels like as a result, such state enforcement might be argued to sweep more broadly than congressional enforcement. Um, under our, my yeah, I feel like the states already have more broadly sweeping enforcement because they're the only ones that enforce it. Because con- Congress doesn't do elections like that. But I don't know. Okay. Um, finally, state enforcement to Section Three with respect to the presidency would raise heightened concerns. Quote, in the context of the presidential election, state-imposed restrictions implicate a uniquely important national interest, end quote, but state-by-state resolution of the question of whether Section 3 bars a particular candidate for president from serving would be quite unlikely to yield a uniform answer consistent with the basic principle that, quote, the president represents all the voters in the nation, end quote. I don't know what this has to do with anything yeah, at all. Yeah, it's all, it's it's all just, about consequences. This is pragmatic. Yeah. You could have, in, yep, yeah. it, it could all be just a shit show. Conflicting state outcomes concerning the same candidate could result not just from the deferring views of the merits, but from variations in state law governing the proceedings that are necessary to make Section 3 disqualifications, uh, deter- uh, disqualification determinations. Some states might allow a Section 3 challenge to succeed based on a preponderance of the evidence, while others might require a heightened showing. Certain evidence like the congressional report on which the lower courts relied here, might be admissible in some states, but inadmissible hearsay in others. Disqualification might be possible only through criminal prosecution, as opposed to expedited civil proceedings in particular states. Indeed, in some states, unlike Colorado or Maine, where the Secretary of State recently issued an order excluding former President Trump from the primary ballot, procedures for excluding an ineligible candidate from the ballot may not exist at all. The result could well be that a single candidate would be declared ineligible in some states, but not others, based on the same conduct and perhaps even the same factual record. And I really like that last point, even the same factual record, because this is where the human factor of law is unavoidable. Because even if somehow you could have literally the same trial twice, the fact finder, as they're weighing the evidence and the value of the evidence, are going to come to different conclusions. They're going to think about things differently. So if you have a case that's marginal, you could have one fact finder go one way and another fact finder go the other way on exactly the same factual record. Can I just, can I ask a quick question then on the, because this is just what I don't understand, is we must say that the authors of the 14th Amendment were unimaginably fucking stupid people. And everybody in Congress at the time that voted in favor of it were unimaginably fucking stupid because they didn't attach a requirement for a conviction or some other process by which they explicitly lay out how this disqualification process should go. Rather, they use language that's found in, uh, what was it, Article 2 of the Constitution or language found in the 22nd Amendment that seems to map on perfectly there. I don't understand how this isn't just a pragmatic argument rather than one of actual law. I think it is a pragmatic argument, especially considering the fact that this is the system that exists today already. So right now, as we all know, right, like there are candidates who are not on every ballot because states don't put them on the ballot Mm -hmm. because states have other requirements to be put on the ballot. That's a a patchwork. Uh, Oh, and then also, um, yeah, also, sorry, God. Go ahead, you go. I was going to say, also, as a quick thing, too, that the framers of this amendment were so stupid that they didn't distinguish, like, state and federal officers either, which was also, I guess, an incredibly stupid oversight that we're not reading And we are treating them differently, even though they're, I don't, where's the evidence that they would treat them differently, um, other than the kind of high global purpose that you're citing? There's no records of discussions about how we're going to treat these these things differently. It's just all kind of purposive, uh, purposive, which I thought the court was sort of leaning against. Um, Mm -hmm. but, But more to the point, this doesn't solve the patchwork problem. Because states already could have different procedures for assigning their electors in different places, and they already do. Courts, right, or sorry, states right now are empowered, if they wanted to, to disqualify people for a bunch of reasons, not anything that otherwise conflicts with the Constitution. But oh, and then also, I think it's I think it's also we take it for granted. But like, imagine if instead, I believe Nebraska and Maine are the only two states that do proportional electoral. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Imagine if it was fifteen states that did that. Do you think that conservatives in California or uh, liberals in Alabama wouldn't be constantly petitioning the Supreme Court saying, like, why the fuck is my state allowed to assign every single elector um, to to the person that wins the majority vote? That's insane. Um, I only say that because I read this next section here. The patchwork that would likely result from state enforcement would sever the direct link that the framers found so critical between the national government and the people of the United States as a whole. But I don't think for presidential elections, is is there a direct link 
between the national government and the people of the United States? Or is there a direct no. link between the national the government states. and the state governments? Yeah. Yes. That, that's that's a, such a weird there, statement. There's a fundamental break, and it all comes down and grounds out to the same thing, that there's not a reckoning with how the presidential election is run. And listen, I disagree with how we run our presidential elections. I think it should be a direct popular vote, but that's not our system. If the states have the authority to just assign their electors however they want, and no one seems to deny that, then how can we say that this patchwork is a problem. This patchwork is a feature. It's by design, yes, literally, yeah. But um, US term, oh, okay, yeah, sorry, then it references that case. But in a presidential election, the impact of the votes cast in each state is affected by the votes cast, or in this case, the votes not allowed to be cast for the various candidates in other states. Um, Here's a quick question, and I didn't read this case. We don't have time to go over it completely. Why then, with this rationale, why did the, wasn't it, was it this same Supreme Court that shot down the Texas v. Pennsylvania case? Yes. Why? Mm -hmm. If we were using this rationale, wouldn't Texas then have had a good argument? I totally agree. Texas didn't have standing. Wait, 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 why? wait, 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 hold on. In a presidential election, quote, the impact of the votes cast in each state is affected by the votes cast uh, or votes not allowed to be cast for the various candidates in other states. It's Why couldn't Texas point. argue that they have standing yeah. here then if? Then, then that, case should, that case was wrong, Texas versus Pennsylvania. If it's the case that we have this unitary view with where certain states electoral votes decide others, then of course Texas has a, sta has a stake in what's going on. And every Just state like, has a stake. And every state has a stake in what's going on. The whole point of that case Texas versus Pennsylvania was, no, no, no. Texas doesn't have a say in how Pennsylvania's electoral votes are allocated. That seems to be directly undermined by this case. But that's not quite right because as you noted, the constitution itself says the states shall choose their elector. So when it comes to that matter, Pennsylvania gets to make the choice as to how it conducts its procedures consistent with well, but the US Constitution. He, he, I think the big issue is, so what you just said is, the states shall choose their electors. I'm overstating uh, the court's decision here, but it sounds like the court is almost saying like, well, the state kind of can, but like we need to have a big say too. And it feels like historically, I, legally, the state having this like supreme authority over choosing their electors was a big deal. And the states being able to do it, recognizing that we had some, you know, 13, 20, 30, 40, 50, now 50 states, right? That to say that, well, this is bad, we can't allow this thing to stand because now there might be a patchwork. Well, by definition, the states being allowed to dictate their electors creates a sort of patchwork, but that's like part of the feature of our- Well, be that, as, yeah. be that as it may, but it's a, it's, a, it's a patchwork as to that thing because oh, the constitution says it. It doesn't necessarily speak, the specific here isn't necessarily speaking to the general. I, I, I'm, about to, I'm about to address your point. So you, may, you brought up a point which is like, well, even if they had an interest, um, they were just wrong because states can have their own procedures, even if they had an interest. I probably would agree with you on the merits there, uh, Kurt. I think that's a good point. But the point is, this was a standing analysis. And the standing huh. analysis was, does Texas even have an interest? Like, we're not even gonna address the underlying legal issue. It's like, does Texas even have an interest in how Pennsylvania assigns its electoral votes? And the court emphatically, seven to two, decided that, no, they don't have an interest. But here, this patchwork theory, which is maybe a gloss, maybe it's not necessary for their opinion, but it's certainly part of what's going on here is that they view the president or all federal positions as these kind of like national unified offices. That seems to directly undermine the holding in the Texas versus Pennsylvania case where they found no standing for Texas to sue Pennsylvania. Now you could say Pennsylvania still wins, but what the Supreme Court says, we're not even gonna listen to the merits because there is no interest for Texas. That's I think Stephen's point, and I think it's a really good one. Yeah, and then like mm, another idea. another further thing. This would be super interesting. Um, mo so some states have sore loser laws, right? Where if you yes. lose, you're not allowed to switch. So say Trump is obviously it's not going to happen, but let's say that Trump did lose on the ballot to um, Nikki Haley, and he decides that he wants to run as a third party candidate. Do these sore mm -hmm. loser laws all now get knocked out as unconstitutional because it creates a patchwork of ballots now? Very well Trump might for the answer for the same reason we were talking about earlier because now we're talking about this is a federal aspect mm -hmm. that is the the qualifications to be present are federal in their nature. So the states are not adjudicating with respect to 
their state interest, but a federal interest or a federal qualification, more of the point. Yeah. So yeah, I think you could very well challenge the uh, sword so loser laws under the same idea. So then yeah, I think what's the interesting- goes the ballot access and, and the signatures. Why do we need to get- Yeah, that's, well, that's what I said earlier. I said, I think you then, might okay, be able so to Okay, so then DGG that. should do a campaign to just sure. load well, there's, all of these they things could, with, yes. with well, DGG, well, wait, if you quick, need a Supreme quick. Court lawyer, I'm a, I'm licensed to practice, and if you're willing to pay for something, the money, well, we'll talk. But the court something would never allow that, and you know they so, would. Something that I think is really interesting. Hey, I'm going to pay either way. Earlier, this this Supreme Court decision references like the balance between state and federal when it comes to, I guess, like figuring out these elections. It sounds like they don't want to balance. They just essentially want like this unitary federal election system. Like It seems like by design of this decision, they want to eliminate the patchwork and just have a consistent set of standards across all states which seems to be in contrary to how our constitution delegates, I guess via the electors clause states to run their elections. I don't understand that. And in contrary to all the arguments I've heard about the interstate uh, popular vote compact, where they're like, you can't do that. You can't assign all your electors, da, 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 da. But if they were to, if states were to decide to assign their electors according to the popular vote and the court were confronted with this language, how could they argue that like this is not allowed for them to do that if it's the case that um, the popular vote gets rid of it, all patchworks then it's just one vote uh, effectively even though we're using the electoral yeah. college and so if the whole thing is trying to make it more national it, it almost seems like the supreme court is undermining the very electoral college system that we're running in a in a bigger way than even though it doesn't appear to be a full frontal assault on mm -hmm. article two Mm -hmm. It seems like that in many ways, if you read into it a little bit. Maybe I'm reading in too much to it, but I don't think so. An evolving electoral map could dramatically change. Uh, oh, wait, I'll reread the sentence. But in a presidential election, the impact of the votes cast in each state is affected by the votes cast, or in this case, the votes not allowed to be cast for the various candidates in other states. An evolving electoral map could dramatically change the behavior of voters, parties, and states across the country in different ways and at different times. The disruption would be all the more acute and could nullify the votes of millions and change the election result if Section 3 enforcement were attempted after the nation has voted. Nothing in the Constitution requires that we endure such chaos arriving at any time or different times up to and perhaps beyond the inauguration. This is These are all just like pragmatic arguments that already yep. still kind of apply, but... Um, okay. Um, for the reasons given, responsibility for enforcing Section 3 against federal office holders and candidates rests with Congress and not the states. The judge, also, I just want to say in reading this, it's, it's, kind of, it's funny because it's, I, traditionally conservatives are seen as like the state power people, but like this argument is essentially making like the most like lib cuck argument ever of like states and individuals are retarded. We need the federal government to handle this because you guys are going to fuck everything up. So we're just doing this federally, um, which is... Yeah, interesting. But for the reasons given, responsibility for enforcing Section 3 against federal office holders and candidates rests with Congress and not the states. The judgment of the Colorado Supreme Court, therefore, cannot stand. All nine members of the court agree with that result. Our colleagues writing separately further agree with many of the reasons this opinion provides for reaching it. See post, part one, blah, blah, blah. So far as we can tell, they object only to our taking into account the distinctive way Section 3 works and the fact that Section 5 vests in Congress the power to enforce it. These are not the only reasons the states lacks power to enforce this particular constitutional provisions. Uh, provision with respect to federal offices, but they are important ones, and it is not, and it is the combination of all the reasons set forth in this opinion, not as some of our colleagues would have it, just one particular rationale that resolves this case. In our view, each of these reasons is necessary to provide a complete explanation for the judgment the court unanimously reaches. The judgment of the Colorado uh, Supreme Court is reversed. This mandate, or the mandate, shall issue forthwith. It is so ordered. So what they're saying is they're arguing this is not advisory, and it's not advisory because it's all of these reasons taken in totality, the fact that Congress has exclusive jurisdiction among the federal actors to act on Section uh, 3 related claims is further evidence that states don't have the power to do it. So I, I just do not agree with that, that vision. If what you're relying on, like t take it out of it. So uh, assume that there is no Section 5 at all, Ass right? As just for a second, assume that Section 5 says, and the appropriate federal authority shall enforce it. However, right? You would, mm -hmm. or or even just say the appropriate authority, authority shall yeah. enforce it. Um, if that were the case, I don't think this is this decision changes at all because the same analysis applies. That is, Fourteenth Amendment was designed to 
aggrandize the power of the federal government and to lower the power of the states uh -huh. and therefore uh -huh. states can't enforce section three yeah that's so why i asked earlier section five didn't exist or it was added to the 22nd right. amendment i wonder if that would change anything in this because it doesn't yeah, so seem I, like it necessarily does i yeah. think this is super shifty uh, to, to pretend that the biggest reason why the court reaches the this result at least with the first part isn't the global purpose of uh the 14th amendment i think i think it's just being dishonest about what's going on and pretending that it's just the, you know, it's the combination of all these things, including the consequences. I, I just, I, I don't agree. And, and as you'll see, um, Amy Coney Barrett and the liberal justices don't agree either. I'm going to read. Okay. So <clears throat> Justice Barrett. Oh, before we start, sorry. Yep. Justice Barrett was incredibly based during the oral argument. She, dem I was most impressed of all the justices with Amy Coney Barrett. And I think that this concurrence, even though I agree more with the liberals, I think this, in terms of the expounding their reasons, I think that it's admirable for Barrett to say what she said, and I respect her for, for saying what she said. Justice Barrett concurring in part and concurring in the judgment. I join parts 1 and 2B of the court's opinion. I agree that states lack the power to enforce Section 3 against presidential candidates. That principle is sufficient to resolve this case, and I would decide no more than that. This suit was brought by Colorado voters under state law in state court. It does not require us to address the complicated question whether federal legislation is the exclusive vehicle through which Section 3 can be enforced. The majority's choice of a different path leaves the remaining justices with a choice of how to respond. In my judgment, this is not the time to amplify disagreement with stridency. The court has settled a politically charged issue in the, volatile se in the volatile season of a presidential election. Particularly in this circumstance, writings on the court should turn the national temperature down, not up. For present purposes, our differences are far less important than our, unanimity, our, un our unanimity. All nine justices agree on the outcome of this case. That is the message Americans should take home. I, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. It, it, respectfully, Justice Barrett. And I do respect the decision making here. That the, the intent here is to to try to lower the national temperature. I don't, why would you respect if, if, that intent? No, I respect that that's that, that's what she's saying, oh, and, and okay. I believe her when she says that that's what you sure. that, that that's her actual intent. That is a wholly but not admirable trait of a Supreme Court justice, though. Well, that's not your job. I guess. I guess, but. No, I mean she's she's and the fact what that she, she writes it, rationale. but the fact that she the even writes that undermines separately. the entire po yes. like yeah like why would you even write that like why, listen you're writing this yeah sorry yeah. no yeah I mean like you're saying like listen like we just wrote all this shit but like we're just trying to get you guys to calm the fuck down okay this might not be the best legal analysis but hopefully you guys chill out now that we've like uh, basically placated the masses with the writing that was such an inter like not only do i not really want now in a perfect world we would say that supreme court justices don't necessarily have a political lean that they all do their interpretation of law blah, that would be like in a perfect world but this seems to go like so far in the other direction of like the supreme court is in, is interested in making very political decisions um this ruling came out the day before super tuesday uh this ruling is trying to turn down the national temperature like i want my supreme court justices to be reflective of what the brightest appointed minds in the united states interpret it as law, as interpreted as, as constitutionally coherent law, not their opinions of what they think might calm the country down the most. That's a really strange. I agree, I agree with that, and that's why ultimately I agree that the, that we need to have those differences expounded, and that's why I agree with the liberals more. But I'm just saying that I res I respect the notion that the justices are concerned about the legitimacy of the court in some ways. I don't agree that that should be the overall con consideration. I agree, like you, that they should be the law. And, well, and if anything, I feel like it undermines the legitimacy of the court. Like, let's say, for instance, that, what if there was mass protests and demonstrate? Like, if I read this, okay, the it let's if I could go back in time, knowing that a, a court would rule this way. Well, for Roe v. Wade, I'm I'm doing a full on BLM violent riots in every fucking state. Maybe I can flip a couple justices. Maybe I can flip an opinion or two to my end if I can have them think that like, well, the temperature is like very fucking high. Maybe that changes some form of your legal analysis, or maybe that changes the way that you view, a, you know, a certain historical factor provision. If you feel like part of your job is, you know, the message that Americans should take home. I'll think about that because, yeah, I'll think about I'm, that. I'm you curious right. too, hold on, I'll push you even harder on this because yeah, what, no weren't you of the opinion, for instance, that like, or did you think that Merrick Garland shouldn't be taking into account political considerations when it comes to bringing cases against Donald Trump or when it comes I to doing investigations? Yeah. yeah, so I feel like for my Supreme Court, don't I want my Supreme, like Congress can debate politics. That's what Congress is for. I don't know if I want the Supreme Court 
to but be I also agree with the yeah. DOJ, like the special counsels, when there could be a vision, like a like a view that it were political. I, I'm not sure. How yeah, I but feel that, but in that like. point, the 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 appointing the appointing of that wasn't just a political thing. It was also relating to potentially um, a conflict of interest in regards to political questions, right? Which I think I, they have I a little you. bit. Yeah, Ultimately, I agree with you in terms of I think that what the liberal justices did was right, mm -hmm. and so I don't I don't agree with Amy Coney Barrett's decision. The only question is whether I respect it or whether you super don't respect it, okay. and. You're saying you super don't respect it, and I guess I need to think about it a little more. I just like, that sounds like, in my judgment, this is not the time to amplify disagreement with stridency. Like, what is she saying there? That she would have said well, something different if the political just, climate was she, different? Go ahead. No, well, no, she just, well, yeah, a little bit, yes. She, that's what she's saying. She wants to keep things a little, she wants to tone down the temperature. Which is a valid consideration. So, like, w like would we, it be the case, then, that if Cenk were to challenge his running in the United States, then, and he were to start citing back to this other Supreme Court ruling, is there a chance that, in their opinions, the Supreme Court just like, okay, well, we wrote that because it was, like, a crazy election time, and we don't want 100% stand by this if we look at what we said. But well, kind of what they did with Bush v. Gore in a lot of ways. So, yeah, well, Bush v. Gore, And that's why Bush v. Gore is such a disaster. Not because, ultimately, the Equal Protection Clause doesn't apply to how states run their election, but because they they're pretending that this case doesn't have any precedential value and it's, a, it's just a one-off. And so, uh, you know, maybe destiny is pilling me. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to think about that a little bit more, but okay. But I see what you're saying. Destiny. <clears throat> yeah. The next one is, um, this but, but uh, no, notice what she's saying. She's saying mm -hmm. the, we don't need to decide whether other federal actors can enforce section three, but mm -hmm. the Congress is going beyond the state issue and saying only Congress and they don't need to. Yeah. Because um, it sounds like the court is fucking terrified to hear issues that have yes. uh, that have what, heavy political leanings in them. What could happen, and, and the reason why, what could happen is the very next court case would be in federal court mm -hmm. if if they decided it, and then the court would again, in a manner of months, be forced to deal with this question. And now they can't do the dodge of state law, right? Now they have to actually deal with it. Yeah. And so the court doesn't want to have another situation like that, and so they're decided in a case that's not before them. Yeah. Um, Supreme Court of the United States, Donald, blah, 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 okay. Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan, and Justice Jackson concurring in the judgment. Okay, well, someone did a very sneaky thing. They what? looked up the um, they looked up the metadata. If you look at the top there, it says Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson, JJ. There's only two J's there, right? Okay. And someone looked up the metadata and found out in the metadata it used to say Sotomayor dissenting in part. Oh, mm. interesting. Okay. Very so it, cool. So they so really did want to provide reason. a unified front, not for whatever reason, for the reason that Amy literally stated verbatim, is they really want to provide a unified front to the American public um, on this particular decision. Not on my your dissent in part. Wow. Big balls. Um, concurring, but, but ultimately, that's not what happened. So. Yeah, concurring yeah. in the judgment. If it is not necessary to decide more to dispose of a case, then it is necessary not to decide more. Dobbs v. Jackson, Dobbs. Women's Health Organization, Dobbs. Um, I thought that was a, such an okay. interesting cite, to cite Dobbs. No, and citing Roberts' well, concurring yeah. judgment. So not not citing the majority, citing Roberts. This is, a, in a sense, an attack on Roberts. Of course, yeah, super it, relevant to this, yeah. yeah. That fundamental principle of judicial restraint is practically as old as our republic. This court is authorized, quote, to say what the law is, and quote, only because, quote, those who apply a rule to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule, end quote, Marbury v. Madison. Today, the court departs from that vital principle, deciding not just this case, but challenges that might arise in the future. In this case, the court must decide whether Colorado may keep a presidential candidate off the ballot on the ground that he is an oath-breaking insurrectionist and thus disqualified from holding federal office under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Allowing Colorado to do so would, we agree, create a chaotic state-by-state -state patchwork at odds with our, with our nation's federalism principles. That is enough to resolve this case. Yet the majority goes further. Even though, quote, all nine members of the court, end quote, agree that this independent and sufficient rationale resolves this case, five justices go on. They decide novel constitutional questions to insulate this court and petitioner from future controversy. 
Uh, although only an individual state's action is at issue here, the majority opines on which federal actors can enforce Section 3 and how they must do so. The majority announces that a disqualification for insurrection can occur only when Congress enacts a particular kind of legislation pursuant to Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. In doing so, the majority shuts the door on other possible means of federal enforcement. We cannot join an opinion that decides momentous and difficult issues unnecessarily, and we therefore concur only in the judgment. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on, real quick. This technically means that if the House of Representatives decides not to seat somebody in concordance with Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, that would technically be not possible now due to the Supreme Court decision, correct? I Yes, that's, yeah. what I, that's how I read it. Yeah, okay. Well, I don't, because they did talk about separately about Congresses using its power in the past along these lines. So They did, but that was in to regards to that 1870 Enforcement Act legislation. It sounds like they're saying Congress actually loses the ability to enforce it absent. And also with respect to the one time that the Georgia governor refused to seat a congressman and the House committee decided it. That doesn't really so go anywhere, that? though. And mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like the court's analysis, I agree with you, Kurt. Um, you, you could say that maybe they're suggesting that there could be other mechanisms. And I think there would be other reasons why it wouldn't matter ultimately, because I think the court would, would say that it's like a political question to decide those powers that judges aren't fit to hear those cases. Mm -hmm. And so it, it might be moot, but I do agree with the rationale here is that section five is how you enforce section three and not other parts of the constitution. Mm -hmm. Our constitution leaves some questions to the states while committing others to the federal government. Federalism principles embedded in that constitutional structure decide this case. States cannot use their control over the ballot to quote, undermine the national government, end quote. That danger is even greater, quote, in the context of the presidential election, end quote. State restrictions in that context, quote, implicate a uniquely important national interest, end quote, extending beyond a state's, quote, own borders, end quote. No doubt, states have significant authority over presidential electors, and in turn, presidential elections. That power, however, is limited by other constitutional constraints, including federalism principles. That's what they're saying, is that the power to appoint the So this is the only time in which any of the court is an analyzing that that we talked about. And what they're saying is that just like the equal protection could limit your assignment of, of presidential electors, federalism principles could limit the assignment. And when we but say federalism course, that, principles, yeah. what are we referring to there? Like whatever the winds the, are. The basic well, idea that feels, the states have all power except that which they've given to the federal government. But the thing is, the, it's a particular federalism balance. And the particular federalism balance as enacted by the framers included states assigning electors. And so, I, again, I think it's begging the They keep the mentioning question. this like someone is disputing it, and I don't know why. Because no one is disputing the states why does, assign electors. Why do federalism concern? Then, then the federalism concerns are obviated by the particular sort of federalism that the framers can, sort of had. No one would say cite federalism principles as to why states are not allowed um, to enact uh, general welfare legislation, because we all understand that under the particular uh, federalism that we have, States are allowed to do that, just like states under our version of federalism are allowed to assign electors. And so, again, I think just as with the majority opinion and the per curiam opinion, the, the dissent, the liberals here are dead wrong in citing the general federalism principles. They should be looking more specifically at why do we think that these federal federalism principles apply with force to the presidential electors clause? I, I don't understand what you mean. I'm, I mean, of course, we're talking about federalism, especially when the U.S. Supreme Court's talking about federalism. They're talking about the United States' version of federalism. What else would they be talking about? I, I so, agree with that, but, but, but what, I think that this, this what the quote is doing, I think, in a kind of shifty way, is not recognizing the true power inherent in the presidential electors clause. And that it's assuming that because that there's some other federalism limit on on the presidential electors clause and let me give you an example of why that is suppose that a state were to have some of their own standards of section three a state version of section three it's not based in it's based in section three in terms of a lot of the inspiration but sure it's entirely a product of state like law. a state version of the first yes. amendment i'm there do you think that the court would step in and say you can't apply that no, of course not. If the states can have their own version of the First Amendment. So then and what the US are we Supreme, talking about The U.S. Here, Supreme right? Court's without power to interpret a state's okay. version of the First Amendment. But then what are we talking about here? Then what are the federalism concerns? If a state can do the exact same thing and just title their provision 
state version of Section 3, then what are these overriding federalism concerns? It sounds like with respect to state officials, with respect to state officials and their state constitution. Wait, wait, wait. Why couldn't they do it? Why can't states, you know, you recognize that states are allowed to put all kinds of limits on on the presidential electors. No, I don't. Oh, you don't. I was. That. I've been arguing about this for an hour that I'm not sure that they can. I don't know oh, okay. that they can do. I don't know okay. that they can do signature requirements. I don't know that they can do any of those things. I don't know that that's possible. Well, but it okay. seems like right now the the established law, common law, whatever the fuck we would call it, procedures, is nobody feels yeah. like that's against the Constitution, right? Well, I guess so. But this this decision, in order to because. Pisco is right in so much mm-hmm. as it creates a cognitive problem. Yeah. But one way to resolve the cognitive problem is be able, is to like basically say, okay, I'm going to resolve it by saying the states don't have power to do any of this stuff. Yeah, but then it's the interesting that we give it to due them. to pragmatic concerns over one amendment that was amended to the Constitution. Now we've created like a watershed case. <laughs> Uh, to, to try to like reorganize well, so talking, many of the different... talking about the Supreme Court not speaking beyond the immediate issue mm-hmm. obviously they're not speaking about anything other than this issue and Pisco already thinks they've gone too far as it is so it's it's all the better that they haven't tried to say and also by the way you know, the elector your signature requirements are invalid and all this other stuff because that stuff has got to leave for another day. I think I, the, the issue is just that the arguments that they've laid out seem like they could apply to all of that. Like even the framing in this first paragraph, I don't know if I ever brought this up earlier, but it's, I feel like it's a little strange when it says states cannot use their control over the ballot to undermine the national government. That danger is even greater in the context of presidential election. Like a state is undermining the national government by applying a part of the constitution to the ballot access. Or like, how, what, like, what does it mean then? Is it any single time a state decides who is allowed on the ballot, are they undermining the national government? Keep in mind that this is the same national government that has the capability in Congress to completely alleviate any injury due to Section 3. The same Congress has the ability to do that. The same national government that could remove this from the Constitution. Like, that just seems weird here that I just feel like it's this crazy undermining, which I think Pisco said, and I probably don't even necessarily disagree. If you want to do like a unitary federal electoral system, I, it's probably fine. I don't know if I have a strong feeling against that. But this is like, a, I feel like it's a huge step in that direction. Like, does that not feel I mean, weird for anybody to say that like states are undermining the national government by controlling who has access to the ballot? That just seems like a really well, with respect thing. to federal officials, because uh, the, as the majority opinion points out earlier, like all federal officials, the entire federal apparatus is by the states granting portions of its sovereignty because the states collectively have done that and merged it together. No individual state can bring it back because they've 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 melded it together in some sort of thing that we call the federal government. True, the so federal government, but for the state election- can no longer undermine it. But the federal government doesn't run elections. That seems to be a power that is like completely delegated to the states via the electors. Well, the the federal constitution does give authority to the Congress to state the, to provide for the time, place, manner of elections. Mm-hmm. So it's true that states do it now, but the constitution does give authority for the Congress to do it if they don't like what the states do. Well, hold on. It delegates that particular power, right? Enumerated, like, or we, it, it's a Congress of delegated power, so they can do the time, manner, and place of the election or whatever. Um, yeah. But they, but it doesn't say anything there about ballot access. And if, if that's not explicitly delegated to the Congress via legislation or constitution, why would we assume otherwise, given the electors clause allows states to choose their electors for who they want to elect as president? Well, because it would have to, it would necessarily have to be a matter of federal law because these are officials within the federal government. So it would have to be federal law. So obviously the federal government law is going to be the one that, that controls. The states can't undermine the federal law. That's just the supremacy of the federal constitution. Well, but the federal, I just don't understand because it's like, like again, like signature requirements or voter ID to vote in an election. Like could affect, yeah. like imagine if the Democrats were to say, we think we would have won this election if everybody was allowed to vote. Your ballot access or the way that you run your elections as states by requiring voter ID is unconstitutional because it's undermining the, the national government. I think states... I think individual Democrats have said exactly that in the past. And how have those arguments fared in court? Well, not great. But then again, (laughs) the arguments here aren't fair and great in court for the same reason. It's like, yeah, I mean, Stacey Abrams, I love you. No way. These arguments are, these arguments got a 9-0 win. 9-0. Yeah. That's a fantastic. Well, with the idea that states can't interfere is my point. That was the consistency. But states can interfere in other ways. They can interfere Mm -hmm. as, as, 
We keep looping on the same. Point. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay, let me let me finish reading this real quick so that I because I have like five minutes. Okay, um, and it's like three pages left. So the majority rests on such principles when it explains why Colorado cannot take petitioner off the ballot. State by state resolution of the question whether Section Three bars a particular candidate for president from serving, uh, the the majority explains would be quite unlikely to yield a uniform answer consistent with the basic principle that the president represents all the voters in the nation. That is especially so, the majority adds, because different states can reach conflicting outcomes concerning the same candidate not just from diver deferring views of the merits, but from variations in state law governing the proceedings to enforce Section 3. The contrary conclusion that a handful of officials in a few states could decide the nation's next president would be especially surprising with respect to Section 3. The re um, ah, fuck, I'm so sorry. Hold on, real quick. The contrary conclusion that a handful of officials in a few states, but that's not true because all 50 states in the United States are democracies. If you don't like the rulings of your particular state legislatures or your particular election officials oh, or even no. your state Supreme Court uh, officials, like you, all of these seats are voted or appointed by elected officials, right? It's not just a few people. None of these are ran as dictatorships, um, but... It's just, okay. The Reconstruction Amendments, quote, were specifically designed as an expansion of federal power and an intrusion on state sovereignty, end quote. City of Rome, the United States, Section 3 marked the first time the Constitution placed substantive limits on a state's authority to choose its own officials. Given that context, it would defy logic for Section 3 to give states new powers to determine who may hold the presidency. Old powers. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, the power is there. It's just expanding the, the requirements under that power, basically. Um, it would be incongruous to read this particular amendment as granting the states the power, silently no less, to disqualify a candidate for federal office. They're setting the, they're setting the Yeah, earlier in the, yeah. This provides a secure and sufficient basis to resolve this case. To allow Colorado to take a presidential candidate off the ballot under Section 3 would imperil the framer's vision of a, quote, federal government directly responsible to the people, end quote. Would it imperil it if they <clears throat> took a person off for any other federal qualification? Yeah. Again, the court way. should have started and ended its opinion with this conclusion. Yet the court continues on to resolve questions not before us. In a case involving no federal action whatsoever, the court opines on how federal enforcement of Section 3 must proceed. Congress, the majority says, must enact legislation under Section 5 uh, prescribing the procedures to ascertain what particular individual should be disqualified. Um, these, musing, bleh, these musings are as, inadequately, uh, are as inadequately supported as they are gratuitous. I mean, start, she does have a point. Wait, real quick. She does have a point. Sure, yeah. And, and, and Amy so. said the same, yeah. To start, nothing in Section 3's text supports the majority's view of how federal disqualification efforts must operate. Section 3 states simply that, quote, no person shall, unquote, hold certain positions and offices if they are oath-breaking insurrectionists. Nothing in that unequivocal bar suggests that implementing legislation enacted under Section 5 is critical, or for that matter, what that word means in this context, uh, in fact, the text cuts the opposite way. Section 3 provides that when an oath-breaking insurrection is disqualified, Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove such disability. It's hard to understand why the Constitution would require a congressional supermajority to remove a disqualification if a simple majority could nullify Section 3's operation by repealing or declining to pass implementing legislation. Even petitioners' lawyers acknowledged the tension in Section 3 that the majority's view creates. Similarly, Do you understand that point, Stephen? Um, that that point is that Congress need, the amendment says you need to have two thirds of a majority to disqual to undo it. Yeah, but you would only need a simple majority to pass to not implement legislation. Yeah, or, so or, yeah. why the tension with so much involving Congress seems contradictory, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, similarly, nothing else in the rest of the 14th Amendment supports the majority's view. Section 5 gives Congress the power to enforce the amendment by appropriate legislation. Remedial legislation of any kind, however, is not required. All the Reconstruction Amendments, including the Due Process and Equal Protection Guarantees and prohib uh, Prohibition of Slavery, are self-executing, meaning that they do not depend on legislation. Similarly, other constitutional rules of disqualification, like the term, like the two-term limit, oh, cool, uh, other constitutional rules of disqualification, like the two-term limit on the presidency, do not require implementing legislation. Um, and, and by the way, the majority never addresses that. It's the only time that they address that. Yeah. Nor does the majority suggest otherwise. It simply creates a special rule for the insurrection disability in Section 3. The majority is left with next to no support for its requirement that a Section 3 disqualification can occur only pursuant to legislation enacted for that purpose. It cites Griffin's case, but that is a non-president... Uh, pre precedential lower court opinion by a single justice in his capacity as a circuit judge. Once again, even petitioner's lawyer distanced himself from fully embracing this case as probate of Section 3's meaning. Uh, see, blah, blah, blah. The majority also cites Senator Trumbull's statements that Section 3 provide no means for enforcing itself. The majority, however, neglects to mention that the senators view that it is the 14th Amendment that prevents a person from holding office with the proposed legislation, simply affording a more efficient and speedy remedy for affecting the disqualification. 
So the per, per the person they cite is the one that's saying that it's it is self-executed. Yeah, and that legislation can be additive, not required. Yeah. yeah. Ultimately, under the guise of providing a more complete explanation for the judgment, um, the majority resolves many unsettled questions about Section 3. It forecloses judicial enforcement of that provision, such as might occur when a party is prosecuted by an insurrectionist and raises a defense on that score. The majority further holds that any legislation to enforce that provision must prescribe certain procedures tailored to Section 3, um, ruling out enforcement under general federal statutes requiring the government to comply with the law. By resolving these and other questions, the majority attempts to insulate all alleged insurrectionists from future challenges to their holding federal office. Yep. Um, just as a quick thing, so this means that under this ruling, if a president was federally indicted and then convicted of insurrection, a state still wouldn't have the ability to remove them from the ballot, correct? That seems to be what the majority mm. opinion holds. Because if they don't pass additional legislation to actually say that, well, with a conviction, the state can remove oh. a federal officer, right? Yeah, that's a yes. good point. I yeah. don't know. So yeah. this means even, even with even with a federal conviction of insurrection, the state would still not be able to remove a federal office holder from a ballot without Congress passing additional legislation. Yeah, why would it? Exactly. Why would yeah. It? Right. yeah, which is well, also I funny. Mean, or go ahead. I mean, if you're convicted under the Insurrection Act, uh, the 2383, it provides for that by its own terms. No, so you're there. No, it doesn't say states can enforce that disqualification. Wait, wait. What is um, what was it? Is so it 2383? The, the yeah, yeah, 18 U.S.C. 2383. That does disqualify you, but where does it say that states are allowed to enforce that on their ballots? To take note of a, it's taking note of a federal determination at that point. They're not deciding anything for themselves. They're simply taking note of a determination that's already been made. Uh, okay, so but but where does Congress say that you can use these determinations in state courts? Well, I mean, at that point, it's like a state taking notice of another state's determination. It's just uh, well, fair, fair faith and application well, of law. Credit? Wait, 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 yeah. wait. Hold on. Wait. I super don't understand. The ending here is it's using the exact same language, basically. Yeah. Shall be. Shall be incapable of holding any office under the United States. Okay. Well, where does the Constitution afford... Uh, states to be able to make these determinations, or where does it afford? No, but state if if you're convicted under the statute, the federal government made the determination because this is a federal law. Yeah, but the federal so the governments conviction... are the ones running the. Th then that would mean that the federal government, by this law, can impeach somebody that gets elected as president, or or maybe. Well, why, why can they? Well, the federal yeah. government can impeach anyone for anyone they recently want. Yeah, but I'm just saying that I don't know why this would afford. This doesn't mention anything about states being able to bar somebody from the ballot. No, it doesn't in its, under its own terms, but this would be just the state taking notice of a federal determination and saying, well, the federal government already made the determination that the federal law is supreme. Okay, so we're not saying. we're not making a determination. We're merely applying the determination in a okay. reverse full faith and credit uh, way. I, I, I can understand me. that. I, I can understand that what you're saying is- Well, but uh, earlier, uh, well, well, hold on. But earlier, perfect. the determination wasn't the problem. Earlier, the determination wasn't even at issue. It was procedural. Earlier, it was a power afforded to the state. The state cannot. A power to make a determination. Yeah. To make the, the determination. Or, yeah. But Kurt, here, they're not making a here, determination. They're taking notice of someone else's determination. Yeah. yeah. I, I, under, I understand that, but I, I still think that there are issues here. Like, could Congress, if it wanted to, pass the statute and also exclude state courts from enforcing it? I think they could. And so I, I don't understand why we should read states having the ability to enforce that unless it's explicitly provided for. Uh, I, I suppose the federal government can prevent the states from enforcing the federal law, just as the states can prevent the federal government from enforcing its law or mandating its anti-commandeering doctrine. So sure, if they want to. Yeah, okay. I don't know. But I have to think, what is it, if, we, if we're talking about matters of determination too, does that mean conviction for determination? Because it's interesting well, to note that, like, because, because it's interesting the, to note that the in the impeachment proceedings for Donald Trump, the majority of the Senate said that it was an insurrection. Now they didn't pass the um, supermajority or whatever is needed for the conviction on insurre on the sure. impeachment stuff, but a majority, I think it was fifty four senators, said that it was an insurrection. Right. So is that does that count as a determination? Interesting argument. I'm not sure anyone's ever tried that specific I, version. I don't. But. I don't think it would. But like, th think again. Also, like. Why is it? Why, why is it that what, is a state required under your theory, Kurt, to enforce a disqualification if it occurs under this criminal statute? Would they be requ required to? Well, I think so because the federal law is supreme, so they would have to. They would have to give the federal law its its due notice. The the federal the courts are the state courts and 
are bound to enforce the federal law. Every state official's bound to enforce the federal okay. law. It's part of their oath. So, so what you're saying is, and maybe I agree with you, uh, um, maybe I agree with you, if there was a conviction under the statute and a state just decided to assign its electors to whoever was convicted, you'd be able to sue in state court or federal, at least federal court. To yeah, I have no problem with that. Okay. Also, let me read yeah, this last page real quick. Yeah. Um, what it does today, the court should have left undone. Bush v. Gore uh, is quoted here. Oh, okay. Um, the court today needed to resolve only a single question, whether an individual state may keep a presidential candidate found to have engaged in insurrection off its ballot. The majority resolves much more than the case before... Um, in the case before us, although federal enforcement of Section 3 is in no way at issue, the majority announces novel rules for how that enforcement must operate. It reaches out to decide Section 3 questions not before us and to foreclose future efforts to disqualify a presidential candidate under that provision. In a sensitive case crying out for judicial restraint, it abandons that course. Section 3 serves an important, though rarely needed, role in our democracy. The American people have the power to vote for and elect candidates for national office, and that is a great and glorious thing. Um, the men who drafted and ratified... Uh, but... The, but. but the men who drafted and ratified the 14th Amendment, however, had witnessed an insurrection and rebellion to defend slavery. They wanted to ensure that those who had participated in that insurrection and impossible future insurrections could not return to prominent roles. Today, the majority goes beyond the necessities of this case to limit how Section 3 can bar an oath-breaking insurrectionist from becoming president. Although we agree that Colorado cannot enforce Section 3, we protest the majority's use uh, effort to use this case to define the limits of federal enforcement of that provision because we would decide only the issue before us. We concur only in the judgment. Oh. Damn, what a decision. Well, yep. Pretty this bad. Has been a very interesting discussion for sure. And I appreciate your views as always, Pisco, on these yeah, issues. Yeah, of course. Even where we disagree. It always makes love, me think. I love chatting with you. And, and honestly, like, I love that you're able and willing to engage on the actual merits as opposed to just being like, Oh my God, BTFO nine oh you had a decision. Like I get that impulse too. And you, you guys, that's all cool. At the end of the day is America. I love the country and there are bad decisions that happen. I believe this is a really bad decision, but we move on and life goes on and we're all good. And I appreciate these conversations even when I believe the court has done something wrong. So just, just to clarify, do you uh, also disagree with the dissent insofar as they would say states don't have the power to do this? You would yes, disagree with even that? Big time. Okay. Yeah, 100%, yeah. All right. Just Big wanted time. just wanted to but clarify. But I do agree. I, I do agree. It's really, really bad for the court to like go on and answer uh, unasked for questions. Uh, really. It's, it's, a, it's I, an interesting debate. I don't really have a strong view on whether or not it's a bad idea or not, but it, it's a good it's a good debate. Like how far beyond the strict contours should you go? and answer other questions because there's definitely been times and i'm sure you would agree where a court has more strictly limited itself and you feel very frustrated because it's like couldn't you just take yeah, the next I, step or two and be like I mean, I this is that. a little this is a little frustrating I, I understand that and it's funny that they're all citing like marbury and stuff when marbury is like the worst example of going beyond of expanding the powers of it to. uh yeah so like i i get that but in this particular case if we're going to take any of Amy Coney Barrett's concerns to heart or the conservative justice to heart or what people perceive to be Chief Justice Roberts concerns to heart, then I think that it's even more important not to decide what you don't have to. All right. Also, hey, listen, I love you guys. It's been fun. Um, yeah. I'll talk to you later. Have fun. Thanks for uh, joining us. And thanks for hopping in on Civil Law, too. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Much love. Next time. Bye. -bye. Bye.